Hey there, friends. White wolf, white tree. Ah, yes, yes. Welcome those of you who came from Instagram, where we celebrated with, yeah, a little, a little 80s music. Welcome, friends. We did, uh, this is part two of the Wolf Dream stream. We did part one a few days ago. We discussed all of Brand's dreams. And today we're going to do the White Wolf. We're going to do John and we're going to do Aria. Aria has significantly more. She's got the most wolf dreams in the story. So we'll go ahead and start with John and finish with Aria. Because <laughs> Aria's, Aria's wolf dreams lead to a little Winds of Winter wolf pack Aria talk. So we'll finish with that. It'll be strong. And yeah, hello friends. Welcome. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate y'all on a different day, Thursday, moving target, all that stuff. So if you're just getting a notification and popping in, like, oh my goodness, what's going on? It's a little midweek stream. We only got through, we spent three hours and only did uh, Brand's Dreams on Sunday. So here we are. Without further ado, we're going to dive right in. And we're going to start, actually, with the very first psychic contact between a wolf and a Stark that happens in the story. Let me just adjust. There we go. And this is, of course, like the third, second chapter of the Game of Thrones. This is Bran's chapter. They've just beheaded Garrod, poor Garrod, telling the truth about the White Walkers, got himself beheaded. And uh, they're walking back, and of course, you know, they find the wolf pups in the snow, right? And it's John who points out the symbolism of the wolves and the house. So he says, Lord Stark, John said. It was strange to hear him call father that, so formal. Again, this is Bran's perspective. Bran looked at him with a desperate hope. There are five pups, he told father. Three male, two female. What of it, John? You have five true-born children, John said. Three sons, two daughters. The dire wolf is the sigil of your house. Your children were meant to have these pups, my lord. Bran saw his father's face change, saw the other men exchange glances. He loved John with all his heart at that moment. Even at seven, Bran understood what his brother had done. The count had only come out right because John had admitted himself. He had included the girls, including even Rickon, the baby, but not the bastard who bore the surname Snow, the name that custom decreed be given to all those in the North unlucky enough to be born without a name of their own. Their father understood as well. You want no pup for yourself, John, he asked softly. The dire wolf graces the banners of House Stark, John pointed out. I am no Stark, father. The Lord Father regarded John thoughtfully. Rob rushed into the silence he left. I will nurse them myself, father, he promised. I will soak a towel with warm milk and give him suck from that. Me too, Bran echoed. The Lord weighed his sons long and carefully with his eyes. Easy to say and harder to do. I will not have you wasting the servant's time with this. If you want these pups, you'll need to feed them yourselves. Is that understood? And blah, blah, blah. You got to train them. Then Theon comes in. They'll die anyway. And... Rob's like, they won't die. We won't let him die. It was not until they were mounted and on their way that Bran allowed himself to taste the sweet air of victory. By then, his pup was snuggled inside his leathers, warm against him, safe for the long ride home. Bran was wondering what to name him. Halfway across the bridge, John pulled up suddenly. What is it, John? The Lord Father asked. Can't you hear it? Bran could hear the wind in the trees, the clatter of their hooves on the ironwood planks, the whimpering of his hungry pup, but John was listening to something else. There, John said. He swung his horse around and galloped back across the bridge. They watched him dismount where the wolf lay dead in the snow, watched him kneel. A moment later, he was riding back to them, smiling. He must have crawled away from the others, John said. Or been driven away, their father said, looking at the sixth pup. His fur was white where the rest of the litter was gray. His eyes were as red as the blood of the ragged man who had died that morning. Bran thought it curious that this pup alone would have opened his eyes while the others were still blind. An albino, Theon Greyjoy said with wry amusement. They're British, so they say albino instead of albino. 
Even though I'm not doing the whole British accent because that would be very unlistenable. This one will die even faster than the others. Jon Snow gave his father's ward a long, chilling look. I think not, Greyjoy. This one belongs to me. All right, so a lot happened there. This, is, this will be a fun scene to dissect. So first of all, character building for Jon in a lot of ways, right? He's selfless. He, he takes himself out of the picture in order to make it work out for the Starks. He's also, um, he's, he's, he's reading the omens of the scene. He's symbolically minded. It's, um, it really is like, so they start off with the omen of the stag and the wolf. And they all look at each other like, uh, this is a bad omen. Okay, yeah, we'll get to the silent sound that John heard in a second. So we'll, there's layers to this. We'll just start with the surface story here. And so basically John is, they've just seen, again, a very bad omen. The dire wolf and the stag locked in, you know, mortal combat. They both killed each other. And you can tell that everyone reads it as a bad omen. They look around and there's this silence like, oh God, look, it's Stark and Baratheon killing each other. And of course, this is an omen because Robert and Ned, they don't kill each other, but they essentially uh, have a downfall together that is tied together. And it is Ned trying to come and sort out Robert's affairs that leads to both of their destruction. Well, with a little help from, you know, the Lannisters, obviously. Uh, but <laughs> Mortal Kombat! Da, 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 da. Okay, yeah, so... Shout out if you know the Mortal Kombat soundtrack. Oh boy, that's going back. That's going back. All right, I don't know where that came from. So, following up on the bad omen, John is the one who turns it around. He's like, wait a minute. There's five pups and you have five children. You were meant to have these wolves. So it's very much a turning around of the emotional tenor of the scene. It's like, oh, super creepy and dark. They've killed each other, but now there's this new light. And it's very George Martin, right? From death comes new life. And it's very, you know, cycles of nature and all that stuff. So John is the one who points it out. And crucially, he does it by omitting himself. So it's character building on a couple levels because we see John's selflessness, but also his sort of, eye for the omens there, spiritual mindedness there. It's interesting. And then, so he's rewarded for this, essentially, by being given a pup of his own. It's kind of like, almost like a parable, uh, you know, from the Bible or something, where somebody is humble, and they give up, they give up something of their own for someone else, and then they're rewarded by being given that thing back even better. He gets the coolest wolf and its eyes are open when the others aren't. And of course, in these early chapters, much is made of John being watchful and perceptive. Bran sees him as eyes that miss nothing because he's an outsider and that kind of thing. So the, it's interesting, John, you know, Ghost having his eyes open first, John being very watchful. It's an interesting uh, contrast to the fact that Ghost is mute. He doesn't speak, but his eyes were open first. So it's very interesting... Um, contrast there and of course it mirrors the weirwoods which have eyes capable of incredible sight right the green seers can look through the trees and see everywhere but they don't make a sound and neither does ghost make a sound so yes very interesting of course there is this silent sound that only john can hear and this is a very cool little thing that george does that it's one of those magic things that doesn't have a, a real explanation. What did Ghost? He, what did John hear? It wasn't really a sound. Um, and we see something similar in the last Wolf Dreams chapter. Remember when Bran is in Summer? Summer has the experience of the voice without a sound, you know, the presence without a scent. So it's kind of like when you hear the psychic presence in your mind, it sounds like a sound, but it's not quite a sound. It's something you can almost see, but can't. That's what George is trying to get at. And of course, it's not, it's not supposed to be comprehensible. It's supposed to be psychedelic. This is, you know, George's view on fantasy and magic. You know, as someone like Brandon Sanderson, he describes his magic systems in detail. 
and the, how the sorcerers work with the details of the magic. The spells have, you know, specific things that you follow and the reader can understand. George wants it all to be mysterious. So this is how you do that. You won't, you know, you, you get into the realm of things that are confusing and hard to understand with our rational mind, a sound that doesn't make a sound. And that's what John hears. So it's really interesting. It's basically we're supposed to understand that Ghost is calling to John, right? There's, it's not just that John is hearing something, like there's a sound that was probably sent to John. That's the reason why he's the only one that can hear it. So this does lead us to start wondering about Ghost and what his powers and consciousness are. It could be Blood Raven, obviously, pulling the strings in the situation, right? Tapping John on the shoulder a little bit, like, hey, hey, psst, psst. And John's like, what's that sound? So, it, but I, I think it really reads more like Ghost calling to John with his silent bark, right? So you can take your pick. And it does seem like, how did the dire wolf get south of the wall when they're never seen south of the wall? And it happens to be pregnant with all these wolf bait. Like, seems like Blood Raven might have had something to do with something to do with that, excuse me, right? That's the obvious. It's either Blood Raven or like the Weirwood Net, right? Nissa Nissa in the Weirwood Net pulling the strings, but one tends to think that Blood Raven probably led the wolf through the wall, and that's how it got down there. Can animals be green seers? That is a question, Mike Hall, that some people have wondered. You know, is Ghost... Should we be thinking about him not as just a magic wolf, but rather somebody, you know, a wolf that's special, that has its a special gift? Just as some skin changers can be green seers, maybe some wolves can be the wolf equivalent of a green seer, if you will. Um, can more than one person warg the same animal? Could Blood Raven warg into Ghost when he's out hunting? Um, that is a little bit of a gray area. Not usually, and thank you. Not usually, but with an experienced green seer like Blood Raven. What I'm suggesting is that Blood Raven might have warged the wolf mama, if anything. But he might not have needed to fully skin change it in order to give it suggestions. It's hard to say. Blood Raven is very experienced and is a lot of gray area with that. So it's, it's probably open to speculation. Generally speaking, no. It, and once an animal bonds with a skin changer, you know, that's the bond. And if some other skin changer tries to take the animal, it's a, it's a theft. You know, the, the, skin, the original skin changer kind of has to die. Yeah, Ghost is as high confirmed. Um, yeah, so brand skin changes crows that have dead children in them. And that's like a shadow on the soul. That's different. That's like, you know, after a second, when second life happens, the skin changer fades into the animal. So this, that, you know, these, these ravens have had their skin changers second lives fade into them centuries and centuries ago. So they're only a little bit of a shadow. So that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, it does seem like Blood Raven could be a part of this, but I do tend to think that there's something special about Ghost. He looks like a damn weirwood tree, eyes open first, doesn't make a sound. But again, you see why I wanted to read this, uh, this scene. It's very much setting the tone for John and Ghost's bond. And obviously, we can see now that the name Ghost is very simple and obvious foreshadowing, right? John's ghost is going to be in his wolf. It, it is right now. Technically, it's been in there for, you know, 11 years or whatever it is. <laughs> so, uh, it's pretty wolfy by now. No, I'm kidding. It's only been a few days. So... How old do ravens get? In a, oh, that's that, I'm sorry. Did I just say that ravens are centuries old? That's probably a little bit silly. We don't. Okay, that's true. Sorry. I just started a random 800 year old raven theory. <laughs> Very silly. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. I was probably thinking of the weirwoods. Yeah. Okay. So they do live a long time. Somebody look it up. Let's see how long ravens live. Some of these parrots can live to be like 80 years. Maybe that's why I think about birds as being eternal. <laughs> the chat's like, yeah, I was 
I was wondering about that. <laughs> Not centuries, but they would be, the point is they're many years dead. So whatever spirit is in these ravens, like 22-ish years for one kind. Now these are magic ravens. They're, they live to be at least 80. Circa 10 years. No, come on. Come on. That actually doesn't make sense, really. Um, if ravens only lived 10 or 12 years, they wouldn't have the shadows of singers in them because the uh, children of the forest live for hundreds of years. This one, maybe, I don't know if George thought this through, actually. Think about this. How is a raven going to have the spirit of a dead skin changer in it when children of the forest don't hardly ever die very often because they live for centuries and birds only live a couple decades. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Yeah, it's a plot hole. It is. Either that or, and maybe this is why I was thinking the ravens are centuries old because it says they have the spirits of dead singers in them. So again, if the dire wolves are magical, in the wild, yeah, not in captivity. Thank you, Nick Libby. That's very true. Uh, cockatoos like Cleo only live 15 or 20 in the wild, but 40 to 60 in captivity. Hive mind. Yeah, maybe. Is there a raven hive mind? We do, there's no plot holes in A Song of Ice and Fire. We just have it tinfold. Tinfoiled hard enough. Northern Tommy, I'm making you a moderator. Standard moderator. Boom. I haven't, I haven't knighted anyone in a while. And uh, that was terrific. I've seen you around long enough to know your vibes are, are good. So there you go. A new mod is born. All hail Tommy. Wield your sword. Chesley. All right. So, yeah, we, I, I'll have to ask Tim about this. Um, what is, what's the explanation for this? Ravens in captivity can live 70 to 80 years, somebody says. <laughs> corn, corn. All right, we'll move along. But this is, that is an interesting question that we've, we've opened up here. And by the way, let me show you a little artwork. I do have some artwork. I started off with our wolf dreams uh here but i do have of course some very good boy ghost and john artwork so this is by kaizoku uh i can't quite read the kaizoku heim and this is i am the watcher on the walls kind of a flame ghost here which i like yeah a little good boy ghost and this is by Shark's Den. Love the eyes on that one. And of course, the Raven. Sort of classic fantasy John here. Sort of symbolic John. This is by Christopher Abels. I dig this one. Of course, John literally will be in Ghost. So here he is in Ghost, right? That's good for now. We'll keep going. Oh, I got a PayPal. Look at that. From Hunter. Thank you. Quite welcome. No question. Just a thank you. And you can support the program with the PayPal link below. That's always great. So, little life update, guys. Um, I'm putting the move on hold because I need to buy a computer. I'm actually still looking. I'm actively looking for places in the place I want to get to. But my current computer is about two years old and it has become slow. The video editing is full of pinwheels and uh, I'm getting ready to buy a new one this weekend. So those of you who have sent in PayPal's, thank you. The moving fund has become the computer fund. Um, and uh, of course I need a nice computer. So that's much appreciated. And uh, that, that'll help. The Ironborn video would be done by now if not for the pinwheels. So a little behind the scenes. Build your own. I'm not a build your own PC guy. I'm the opposite of that. I don't want to like, I just want the computer to get out of the way so I can write. I don't, I'm not a tech person. Someone teach LML. Yeah, it's not happening. 
I just trade in my old one and buy a new one every couple of years. That's how I roll. But in any case, we don't need to talk specs or anything like that. The point is, faster video editing is coming. I got really fast during House of the Dragon last year, and then I've kind of slowed down because of all the workarounds I've had to do. So it happens. Anyway, moving right along. Next quote. Let me, sorry, let me just highlight this. I've got the first line of all the quotes on a separate doc that I'm essentially using to find the places I need in the Kindle. Yeah, I, I do like Kit as John. Um, you know, I think, I think he works for John. It, when they wrote him more dialogue back in like season five and six, he, he did a pretty good John. Yeah, the pinwheels, they're not funny, baby. It's nothing funny about the pinwheels. It's much rage. Rage-inducing pinwheels. All right, yeah. Sorry, I, I do have to cough a little bit when I first start streaming, just sort of in the morning. This is morning for me. I get up at like noon. Work all night uh, clearing out the cobwebs. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate you, buddy. Okay, so... Outside, one of the guards looked at him and said, Be strong, boy. The gods are cruel. Uh, this is when John is just getting the news, or he just got the news uh, that his father's been arrested as a traitor. He's been accused of being a traitor. Um, oh, I guess he's dead, actually. Yeah, he's dead, and he's... Right, everyone thinks, because of the false confession, that Ned is a traitor. Outside, one of the guards looked at him and said, Be strong, boy. The gods are cruel. They know, John realized. My father was no traitor, he said hoarsely. Even the words stuck in his throat as if to choke him. The wind was rising, and it seemed colder in the yard than it had when he'd gone in. Spirit summer was drawing to an end. So it seems like death foreshadowing for John here, right? The words sticking in his throat as if to choke him, and of course the first wound was from Wick. Across the neck there. So, makes sense. John's death, Ned's death being paralleled. The rest of the afternoon passed, as if in a dream. John could not have said where he walked. Oh, wait a second. Spirit Summer was drawing to an end. I wonder if that's something to do about Bran and Summer. Hmm. Probably more like the seasons and the long night. The rest of the afternoon passed, as if in a dream. John could not have said where he walked, what he did, who he spoke with. Ghost was with him. He knew that much. Yeah, this is all death foreshadowing. That's right. I think I've read this whole chapter, in fact. The sequence of it. Um, but yeah, Ghost is with him. He's in a dream and Ghost is with him. So this is a parallel to... Oh, you know what? I completely forgot. Let's pause this scene and go back to the last one. I'm so sorry. There is some killer foreshadowing in the last quote that I forgot to, forgot to highlight. Uh, actually, no. That'll be disruptive. We'll come back after we're done with this quote. That'll make more sense. Apologies. Yeah, we'll keep going now. Then we'll go back to the first quote. There's just some others foreshadowing you got to look at. So John's in a dream. Ghost is with him. The silent presence of the direwolf gave him comfort. The girls did not even have that much, he thought. Their wolves might have kept them safe, but Lady is dead and Nymeria is lost. They're all alone. A north wind had begun to blow by the time the sun went down. John could hear it scurling against the wall and over the icy battlements as he went to the common hall for the evening meal. Hob had cooked up a venison stew. Okay, let me skip ahead a little bit. His friends rallied to him. Blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Then, Alistair Thorne, not only a bastard, but a traitor's bastard, he was telling the men around him. In the blink of an eye, John had vaulted onto the table, dagger in his hand. Pip made a grab for him, but he wrenched his leg away, and then he was sprinting down the table and kicking the bowl from Sir Alistair's hand. Stu went flying everywhere, spattering the brothers. Thor Thorn recoiled. People were shouting, but Jon Snow did not hear them. He lunged at Sir Alistair's face with a dagger, slashing at those cold onyx eyes. But Sam threw himself between them, and before Jon could get around him, Pip was on his back. Okay, so, two reasons here. Interesting scene. One, 
This John's about to do the same thing. Well, first of all, John is crazy here. In the middle of dinner, he's running down on top of the feast table with a knife in his hand and lunging at Sir Alistair to try to kill him. Like, John's, this is some serious, call it wolf rage, Ulf Hednar rage, you know, berserker fury, the dragon, the dragon fire, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, this is just John going nuts here. Secondly, this is going to be paralleled in a second when John kills the white. He slashes the white across its icy moon face with his sword. And here he he's, wants to slash Alistair across those cold onyx eyes. So it's very much a parallel scene. And uh, Alistair basically is a cold night's watchman. And so is Othor, who he'll fight in the, uh, in the chamber. And that's all because, like, Night's King is a cold night's watchman. So let's skip ahead to... John is... Let's see. They took his knife and sword. He's in his cell. My father is no traitor, he told the dire wolf, and the rest had gone. Ghost looked at him in silence. John slumped against the wall, hands around his knees, and stared at the candle on the table beside his narrow bed. The flame flickered and swayed. The shadows moved around him. The room seemed to grow darker and colder. I will not sleep tonight, John thought. Yet he must have dozed. When he woke, his legs were stiff and cramped, and the candle had long since burned out. I wonder if John will ever get a glass candle scene. This almost seems like a glass candle foreshadowing. One second. If Danny brings a glass candle and sets it up and her and John start using it together. God help us. God help us. That's going to be, uh, yeah. Oh, the romance. The John Danny stuff is going to be so much better in the books than on the show. I thought it had its moments on the show early on when they were talking about the others and stuff and their romance was like tension that was boiling under the surface. When it turned to just them, then it didn't quite work out. But yeah, they're going to use glass candles together. Yeah, no, Mel will be in the background like this and John Danny will be using the candle. No, what, Mel, Mel might be a fire spirit by then. Yeah, devoted to Mariah. She sees my vision. She sees my vision. Anyway, the candle had burned out. Ghost stood on his hind legs, scrabbling at the door. John was startled to see how tall he'd grown. Ghost, what is it? He called softly. Oh, Ghost, what is it? He called softly. The dire wolf turned his head and looked at him, baring his fangs in a silent snarl. Has he gone mad? John wondered. It's me, Ghost, he murmured, trying not to sound afraid. Yet he was trembling violently. When had it gotten so cold? Ghost backed away from the door. There were deep gouges where he'd raked the wood. John watched him with mounting disquiet. There's someone out there, isn't there? He whispered. It's a little bit... This is total Lassie vibes. Let's get Lassie vibes here. (laughs) What? Timmy's stuck in a well? Are there whites in the hallway? (laughs) Yeah, downtown Clanny Brown. Totally trolling me. I'm not even going to rise to that bait. How much time do you think Blood Raven spends inside Ghost? (laughs) No time. I think he can't. I don't don't think he can do that. I don't think he can do that. But we don't know for sure. We're told that that's not possible. But with Green Sears, you never know. (laughs) So there's someone out there, isn't there? He whispered. Crouching, the dire wolf crept backward, white fur rising on the back of his neck. The guard, he thought. They left a man to guard my door. Ghost smells him through the door. That's all it is. Slowly, John pushed himself to his feet. He was shivering uncontrollably, wishing he still had a sword. Three quick steps brought him to the door. He grabbed the handle and pulled it inward. The creak of the hinges almost made him jump. So it's it's creaking extra loud because it's so cold. So obviously this is... We're supposed to, um, the reader at this point might recognize this cold from the prologue. 
where Waymar and the company and Will and the tree keep remarking on how extremely cold it is. So here we can see like John is shivering uncontrollably. How did it get so cold? Then the hinge is making a weird sound because the metal is cold. Um, let's see here. His guard was sprawled bonelessly across the narrow steps, looking up at him. That's a great turn of phrase, sprawled bonelessly. So you can tell just like limbs in unnatural positions, right? Looking up at him, even though he was lying on his stomach. Ah, uh, yeah, that's the problem. His head had been twisted completely around. Wah, wow. It can't be, John told himself. This is the Lord Commander's Tower. It's guarded day and night. This couldn't happen. It's a dream. I'm having a nightmare. Ghost slid past him out the door. The wolf started up the steps, stopped, looked back at John. That was when he heard it. The soft scrape of a boot on stone. The sound of a latch turning. The sounds came from above, from the Lord Commander's chambers. A nightmare this might be, yet it was no dream. So then John goes up and he fights the other. I'm not going to read the whole scene. But of course, Ghost is instrumental, right? Not only does he wake John up, he knows what to do. He's like, come on, let's go. And then during the fight, you can see Ghost take action, save John once during the fight. So you could, again, you could speculate that Blood Raven is doing this, but I don't think so. I think Ghost knows what's up. I think he knows, you know what I mean? He's, he's either got instincts or this is more magical. This is something along the lines of Ghost being connected to the Weirwood Net or, you know, being connected to ancestral knowledge from the Wolf Net or whatever, you know, like whatever. Go if there's something special about Ghost... This is the kind of thing where it would manifest. Now, all the dire wolves do seem to have psychic sense. And this is the other thing I wanted to explore. It could be that Ghost is not special, that all the dire wolves are special, in fact. Like, think about, obviously, at the Red Wedding, Grey Wind, I mean, they had to, like, chain him up. Like, Grey Wind was crazy. He was like, no, nah, do not go in that castle. He knew something was wrong. So... We also see that the wolves have psychic communication across distance. They can tell when each other is getting close or further away. When Lady, when, uh, lady dies, all the other wolves know right away. So there's definitely some amount of psychic activity. Ghost was holding the Night's Watch together, pretty much. Two years squisher, Gerald. Appreciate you, man. And also appreciates Savannah for the PayPal. Thank you. All right, give me a 30 second music break. Reading Rhaegar. Be right back. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. By the way, I got new pedals. New synth pedals. So, I'll have new music at some point. But it's going to be uh it's going to be wild. It's going to be going to be nuts. So, <clears throat> no, pardon me. All right, so, praise Garth. That's this scene. Now, let's go back to that first one real quick. There's just a, a couple things I want to clean up from the silent shout scene. The foreshadowing, when John kills the white, there's some important stuff, um, but it's mostly about like the moon disaster and things like that. It's not really what we're talking about. 
So let's let's tune in to the use of the word other here in this scene where John finds his wolf. That's what we're looking for. So um, your children were meant to have these pups. Bran saw his father's face change, saw the other men exchange glances. So it's like there's others around remarking like, uh, the Starks have wolves now? Hmm. Okay. Then it goes on. I'm no Stark father, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Dee, 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 dee. They won't die, Rob said. We won't let them die. Keep them then. Jory Desmond, gather up the other pups. It's time we were back to Winterfell. So basically the Starks are kind of like the others. And sometimes they get other symbolism so we can see that they have this connection to the others. Um, and that's, that's, that's called out several times in the scene. So the other, gather, up, gather up the other pups. Then John hears the sound. He goes back. And then John says he must have crawled away from the others, the other pups who were just called the others. And of course, ghost, the idea of ghost crawling away from the others is important because John, let me see how to say this simply. John is like the good other. He's John Snow. He's an icy dude. He's going to end up cold hands. He's probably going to be stolen by the others for a time before he's freed. He's an icy guy. However, he's going to fight against the others. This is something that happened in the past. And it's happening again with John. And we've seen it with Cold Hands, too. He's an icy dude fighting against the others. Ghost is kind of similar because Ghost is called a white shadow a bunch of times. And white shadow is a key phrase that describes the others. Pale shadow, white shadow... It's used a bunch of times, but Ghost is also a white shadow at John's side. So everything about John is like otherish, but good. Okay? So he's a white shadow with red eyes instead of a white shadow with blue eyes. So here, the thing that's being emphasized is John and Ghost's opposition to the others. So the other pups, Ghost must have crawled away from the others. Or been driven away, their father said. Um, let's see, eyes were red as the blood of the ragged man. Um, it was curious that this pup alone would have opened his eyes while the others were still blind. So that's three times now the Stark wolves are the others. And the Stark men are the other men, so that's four. And then Theon says, this one will die even faster than the others. So five times now. The Starks and their wolves are the others, and Ghost and John are set in opposition. And then John gave his father's ward a chilling look because John is John Snow, and he says, I think not, Greyjoy. This one belongs to me. So you think about there's a quote about capturing a wolf and training it to guard your flock. It's used as a metaphor for the Reach and the gardener's and how they tend to take the invading Andals, for example, and just sort of co-opt them. And they co-opted the Faith of the Seven. They just co-opt. And they, and, and uh, there's a Garth Gardner king. He's like, yeah, you could fight the wolves or you could capture one and train it to you know, guard your flock. And so that's kind of what the Starks are. The, the, the Starks and the others are both wolves. They both move silently through the woods. The others have tons of wolf symbolism. The Starks are the wolf that is guarding the flock. They are the other. Wolf in sheep's clothing. That's well, So that's when John goes north of the wall and puts on uh, sheep's wool. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Which is symbol that's symbolic of John being stolen by the others. But point is, um, well, no, I guess that is the point. <laughs> this one will die faster than the others. I think not, Greyjoy. Yeah, so... John and Ghost, they are cold. They are, you know, Ghost is a white shadow. John is a snow. However, they are in opposition. So, it's pretty cool. Good stuff there. And let's go to our third quote. 
So that was worth going back for, right? Oh, this is going to be in Clash. Wrong book. All right. This is John and Corin. They are... Yeah, this is when John and Corin are running from the wildlings shortly before he's going to have to kill Corin, I think. Uh, let's see. John did not think sleep would come easily, but he knew the half-hand was right. He found a place out of the wind beneath an overhang of rock and took off his cloak to use it for a blanket. Ghost, he called. Here, to me. He always slept better with a great white wolf beside him. There was comfort in the smell of him and the welcome warmth in that shaggy pale fur. Yeah, you really would welcome... <laughs> the wolf warmth in the frost fangs. Jesus, it's so cold. It just sounds cold, man. It's like, you got a picture being, I don't know what mountain range, the coldest one you could think of. I guess all mountain ranges are cold if you go go up high enough. So, um, this time though, Ghost did no more than look at him. Then he turned away and padded around the garrens as quick as that, he was gone. He wants to hunt, John thought. Perhaps there were goats in these mountains. The shadow cats must live on something. Just don't try and bring it down a cat, he muttered. Even for a dire wolf, that would be dangerous. He tugged his cloak over him and stretched out beneath the rock. When he closed his eyes, he dreamed of dire wolves. There were five of them when there should have been six, and they were scattered, each apart from the others. He felt a deep ache of emptiness, a sense of incompleteness. The forest was vast and cold, and they were so small, so lost. His brothers were out there somewhere, and his sister, but he had lost their scent. He sat on his haunches and lifted his head to the darkening sky, and his cry echoed through the forest, a long, lonely, mournful sound. As it died away, he pricked up his ears, listening for an answer, but the only sound was the sigh of blowing snow. So this is a wolf dream. Um, John doesn't realize it, but this is he's just hopped into Ghost's mind. And that last paragraph, that's what that was. Ghost sensing the other wolves. It's just written through John's mind a little bit. So it's not fully wolf dream language, but this is John dreaming that he's in Ghost and thinking about his pack and his sister and all this stuff. So I guess it pretty much is wolf dream language. Jason Vasquez, what do you think Order of the Green Hands theory. I'm not a fan. That John is Ned and Ashara's trueborn son. Yeah, I hate that theory. And their theory that Ghost being the oldest proves that John is... Yeah, no. I hate that theory. Um, not personally, no personal animus, but like... Yeah, I mean, you're going to like some theories and dislike some theories. Um, I do not like the way they construct their theories. They're a big fan of alternate parentage and this person isn't really dead and... Those theories have a really high bar to clear with me. Um, I don't find it fun. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'll have to do a stream about the parentage theories, but definitely think about RLJ as settled law uh, in my mind. So, n not a fan. No, I'm not going to get sassy. Just not a fan. So, keeping up with this wolf dream here, the only sound was the sigh of blowing snow. John? The call came from behind him, softer than a whisper, but strong, too. Can a shout be silent? So here again, we see the silent shout. It's one of the good ways to make something esoteric and confusing is to use conflicting words. So George loves ice, you know, ice that burns, white shadow. What's a white shadow? You know, like... It's a silent, uh, silent shout. So he turned his head, searching for his brother, for a glimpse of a lean gray shape moving beneath the trees, but there was nothing, only a weirwood. It seemed to sprout from solid rock, its pale roots twisting up from a myriad of fissures and hairline cracks. Guys, this is mushroom talk right here. I just realized this. 
I always looked at this as dream language. And I'll read a couple more sentences. It, streamed, it seemed to sprout from solid rock, its pale roots twisting up from a myriad of fissures and hairline cracks. The tree was slender compared to other weirwoods he had seen. No more than a sapling, yet it grew as he watched, its limbs thickening as they reached for the sky. Wary, he circled the smooth white trunk until he came to the face. Red eyes looked at him. Fierce eyes they were, yet glad to see him. The weirwood had his brother's face. Had his brother always had three eyes? Not always, came the silent shout. Not before the crow. He sniffed at the bark, smelled wolf and tree and boy. But behind that, there were other scents. The rich brown smell of warm earth and the hard gray smell of stone. And something else. Something terrible. Death, he knew. He was smelling death. He cringed back, his hair bristling, and bared his fangs. So, obviously, this is a little time fuckery here, if you will. Um, it sounds like Bran is either in the crypts of Winterfell or in Blood Raven's cave, or a little bit of both. Now, technically, Bran is in the crypts when he comes back and was like, oh, I saw John, you know. So that's when he had this dream and contacted John. However, it really sounds like there's a little bit of time wonkiness here where it almost seems like Bran is in Blood Raven's cave and talking to John. Who knows? But yeah, this, look, the, the weirwoods are mushrooms. They... What we see above the ground is essentially the cap. The much larger part of it is under the ground, just as with fungi. And the, the organism under the ground is the thing that's always there. The caps come and go. So we're seeing, we're seeing basically, this is just what happened at the night fort, right? We see a huge weirwood organism underground connected to the black gate face, and then up in the kitchens, a young weirwood has sprouted through the stone, grown up through the floor, and it's grown. And it's a slender weirwood, just like this one. And that's the one that Bran sees. So here, it seemed to sprout from solid rock, its pale roots twisting up. When the roots are coming up, like those, that's not how a tree works, right? <laughs> The caps are called fruiting bodies. Thank you, Carl Karsnack. Let's keep it scientific here. The fruiting bodies. Yeah, so like, this is not how trees grow. This is how mushrooms grow. They're growing up from the cracks in the rock. That's awesome. And again, literally just like the night for it, growing up through the cracks in the stone floor of the kitchen. So pretty dope. Don't be afraid. I like it in the dark. No one can see you, but you can see them. But first you have to open your eyes, like this. And then the tree reached down and touched him. And suddenly he was back in the mountains. His paws sunk deep in a drift of snow as he stood upon the edge of a great precipice. So Bran is kicking him back into the wolf dream that he was just in, but now John is more aware. In the first paragraph, he wasn't... It's like he dreamed of dire wolves, but he's not aware that he's the wolf quite. But now he is. It says his paws sunk deep in the snow. So John is more like fully pulled into this wolf dream now. And as the dream continues, before him the skirling pass opened up into airy emptiness and a long V-shaped valley lay spread beneath him like a quilt, awash in the colors of an autumn afternoon. A vast blue-white wall plugged one end of the veil, squeezing between the mountains as, it, as if it had shouldered them aside, and for a moment he thought he had dreamt himself back to Castle Black. So he thought he was looking at the wall. Then he realized he was looking at a river of ice several thousand feet high. Under that glittering cold cliff was a great lake, its deep cobalt waters reflecting the snow-capped peaks that ringed it. So it's a glacier and a waterfall. There were men down in the valley he saw now, many men, thousands. And he's looking down. It's basically the other's camp. Blah, 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 blah. And then it says, um, 
Then a sudden gust of cold made his fur stand up and the air thrilled to the sound of wings. And he lifted his eyes to the ice-white mountain heights above. A shadow plummeted out of the sky. A shrill scream split the air. He glimpsed blue-gray pinions spread wide, shutting out the sun. Ghost, John shouted, sitting up. He could still feel the talons, the pain. Ghost, to me. So, then John wakes up. Uh, Eben says, quiet, you mean to bring the wildlings down on us? What's wrong with you, boy? Hey, southern mother of dragons. Nice to see you. A dream, John said feebly. I was ghost. I was on the edge of the mountain, looking down on a frozen river, and something attacked me. A bird. An eagle, I think. Squire Dalbridge smiled. It's always pretty women in my dreams. Would that I dreamed more often. <laughs> Corin came up beside him. A frozen river, you say? The milk water flows from a great lake at the foot of a glacier, Snow and Snake put in. There was a tree with my brother's face. The wildlings. There were thousands. And he goes on. And Corin makes him repeat the dream. John was confused. It was only a dream. A wolf dream, the half-hand said. Craster told the Lord Commander that the wildlings were gathered at the source of the milk water. That may be why you dreamed it. Or it may be that you saw what waits for us a few hours farther on. Tell me. So he's like, oh yeah. It could be your mind filling it in the blanks. Because you, you know, Craster said that's where they were. Or it could be that you saw them. So obviously corn half-hand a.k.a. Rhaegar, and I don't know who he's... He's Mance Raider, and he's Rhaegar, and Arthur Dane, and I forget who else. Um, I'm kidding. He's Corrin Halfhand. Corrin Halfhand has some knowledge of wolf dreams. And so he... And that's probably... You can see that he's always been interested in John as soon as he saw John. So, yeah. He, he looked at... Uh, he looked at Ghost and looked at John and was like, yeah, that's a warg. That's a stark warg, and I'm going to take him under my wing. And this is why. Because he knew he'd be an asset. And so here John has a wolf dream, and Corrin's all over it. He's like, yeah, no, that's a wolf dream. Tell me everything you remember. Because this is how the ancient first men used to do warfare. And the other thing to notice here is the way that Vermeer Sixkins finds Ghost so quickly okay Vermeer is flying around in his eagle he's patrolling and as soon as ghost appeared and spied in on the valley he, so ghost is up on a cliff somewhere now obviously the eagle has really good eyesight but one wonders like Vermeer Vermeer seems the wargs seem to be able to detect each other you know the wolves can detect each other Vermeer definitely oh Orel yeah, not Vermeer. I guess it's Orel at this point. Yes. True. So, anyways, point is, um, I don't care what the wildling's name is. The, the wargs seem to be able to detect each other. So Orel is essentially, yeah. He's, he's seen that there's a warg spying. And he's going with his eagle to attack a wolf, which is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, that's how it worked. Like back in the day, all the armies would have skin changers defending and spying and all that stuff. So pretty cool. And we can see that the, these wolf dreams, like all of this works, again, just like the glass candles and the Valerians, the wolf dreams are not just dreams. They're, they can be used for reconnaissance, basically. Oh, we're going to storm. Wrong book. Symbolism to having a half hand. Um, well, it would give you less fingers. So it kind of makes you like a child of the forest. Hard to say. You know, Davos has kind of a half hand, too with his missing fingers. So yeah, there is some symbolism there, but it's uh, kind of off the beaten path. 
So he dreamt he was back in Winterfell, limping past the stone kings on their thrones. The great granite eyes turned to follow him as he passed, and the great granite fingers tightened on the hilts of the rusted swords upon their laps. You are no Stark, he could hear them mutter in heavy granite voices. There's no place for you here. Go away. He walked deeper into the darkness. Father, he called. Bran? Rickon? No one answered. A chill wind was blowing on his neck. Uncle, he called. Uncle Benjen? Father? Please, Father, help me. Up above he heard drums. They were feasting in the great hall, but I'm not welcome there. I'm no Stark, and this is not my place. His crutch slipped and he fell to his knees. The crypts were growing darker. A light has gone out somewhere. You grit, he whispered. Forgive me, please. But it was only a dire wolf, gray and ghastly, spotted with blood, his golden eyes shining sadly through the dark. The cell was dark, the bed hard beneath him, his own bed, he remembered, his own bed in the steward's cell beneath the old bear's chambers. By rights it should have brought him sweeter dreams. Even beneath the furs he was cold. Ghost had shared his cell before the ranging, warming it against the chill of night. And in the wild, Degrit had slept beside him, both gone now. He had burned Degrit himself, as he knew she would have wanted. And Ghost, where are you? Was he dead as well? Was that what his dream had meant, the bloody wolf in the crypts? But the wolf in the dream had been gray, not white. Gray, like Bran's wolf. Had the Thens hunted him down and killed him after Queen's crown? If so, Bran was lost to him for good and all. John was trying to make sense of that when the horn blew. The horn of winter, he thought, still confused from sleep. But Mance never found Joram's horns, so that, he, so that couldn't be. A second blast followed as long and deep as the first. John had to get up and go to the wall, he knew, but it was so hard. All right, so I'll stop right there. So, what's going on here? I think he's dreaming of Grey Wind, right? Grey Wind has just died at this point. This is in Storm. So, yeah, I believe this is Grey Wind, essentially. Um, and it's interesting, he's appeared in the crypt. So, just like when Ned dies, Rickon and, and uh, Bran both dream of his spirit being in the crypts. Seems like maybe that happens with the wolves, too. Like their spirits are tied to the crypts and they come back there when they're dead. So there might be an... The idea of the Starks being buried in the crypts might go further than what we think. Like if the most ancient Starks were green seers, and those first kings of Winter Thrones are in fact going to be petrified weirwood thrones, and this is my theory about them, then it could be that all the Stark spirits are tied to the crypts in a more magical way because of that weird lineage. Um, and it could be that that is true for the wolves as well. After all, all the Stark statues in the crypts have wolves at their sides. Let's change the artwork. This one is by Michael Comark. It's a good growling ghost. So yeah, it seems like uh seems like when the uh if Rob worked in the Grey Wind when he died, then Grey Wind is Rob. Oh good point, Mike Hall. Good point. Grey Wind died after Rob. So yes, I do believe that Rob died twice, which is extra horrible, if you didn't know that. He would have been murdered upstairs and then warged into his wolf and been killed again. So George really does love to torture Starks. Um, that could be why the spirit ends up back in the crypts, but I'm guessing that all the, uh, all the, um, the wolf spirits are tied to the crypts probably in the same way the Starks are. At least once they've bonded with the Starks, that's probably the thing that does it. Oh, there are more disaster hunting. Listen, the disaster hunters video got skin changed by the spirit of the ironborn. Let's be honest. I started off writing one Ironborn script. As recently as Moat Kalen, I was like, the Ironborn video that I'm going to make. Guys, it's a whole series. I was up to four Ironborn videos when I recorded the most recent one. 
It came out to an hour and 42 minutes. So I had to cut it in half. There's going to be at least five Ironborn videos, if not six. So I'm calling it, it's a new series. It's going to be called The Secret Prehistory of the Ironborn. I'll give you a chance. I know, it's hot. Secret Prehistory of the Ironborn. It's a whole series now, yeah. And yes, I'll have one coming to you next week. For sure. Don't worry. <laughs> there are more coming. Oh gosh, you guys have no idea how deep I've gone with this. I'm having way too much fun. All right, so, yeah. This is pretty much all I want to say about this stream. It's interesting that they're tied to the crypts here. So then we would know, let's see. And that's the only time John sees a wolf in any of his Crips dreams. Also, it's interesting that a horn woke up John from the dream. One wonders if, if maybe there'll be a magic horn or something like that involved in John's resurrection. Because that horn that wakes the sleepers, like, what's the payoff for that? If the Horn of Winter calls the others and Dragonbinder binds dragons, is there a way these magic horns can be used for, like, shadow binding or resurrection? I don't know. Could be. So let's see here. I would need to steal her if I wanted her love. And this is John thinking about you, um, Val. But she might give me children. I might someday hold a son of my own blood in my arms. A son was something Jon Snow had never dared dream of, since he decided to live his life on the wall. I could name him Rob. Val would want to keep her sister's son, but we could foster him at Winterfell and Gilly's boy as well. Sam would never need to tell his lie. We'd find a place for Gilly too, and Sam would come visit her once a year or so. Mance's son and Craster's would grow up brothers, as I once did with Rob. He wanted it, John knew then. He wanted it as much as he ever had wanted anything. I've always wanted it, he thought, guiltily. May the gods forgive me. It was a hunger inside him, sharp as a dragon glass blade. A hunger. He could feel it. It was food he needed, prey, a red deer that stank of fear, or a great elk, proud and defiant. He needed to kill and fill his belly with fresh meat, and hot, dark blood. His mouth began to water with a thought. It was a long moment before he understood what was happening. When he did, he bolted to his feet. Ghost? He turned toward the wood, and there he came, padding silently out of the green dusk, his breath coming warm and white from his open jaws. Ghost, he shouted, and the dire wolf broke into a run. He was leaner than he had been, but bigger as well, and the only sound he made was a soft crunch of dead leaves beneath his paws. When he reached John, he leapt, and they wrestled amidst brown grass and long shadows as the stars came out above them. "'Gods, Wolf, where have you been?' John said when Ghost stopped worrying at his forearm. "'I thought you died on me like Rob and you grit and all the rest. I've had no sense of you, not since I climbed the wall, not even in dreams.' The dire wolf had no answer, but he licked John's face with a tongue like a wet rasp, and his eyes caught the last light and shone like two great red suns. Red eyes, John realized, but not like Melisandre's. He has a weirwood's eyes. Red eyes, red mouth, white fur, blood and bone like a heart tree. He belongs to the old gods, this one. And he alone of all the dire wolves was white. Six pups they'd found in the late summer snows, him and Rob. Five that were gray and black and brown, but five for the Starks. And one white, as white as snow. He had his answer then. And, of course, his answer means his answer to Stannis' offer to take Winterfell, which would have required him to tear up the heart tree. And so he decides he can't do that because he has a werewolf, and that would be wrong. So, yes, the wall blocked their connection. Yes, it did. So we have to wonder about, again, Blood Raven and his ability to contact Bran in dreams. That's obviously not blocked by the wall. 
Um, so it seems like the weirwood net is not interfered with by the wall magic. But the regular warg psychic bond is, to some extent. Now, I really need to do a study on this. Um, I've got a... Yeah, you especially can't tear up a weirwood tree. You'd have to dig. Mel Can you imagine Melisandre? Like, they're trying to dig up the weirwood tree, and they keep digging. And the roots, instead of getting thinner, they're getting thicker and deeper. And they're like, they're still digging. And they're like, I don't know. They're 20 feet down. There's this giant pit. And it's just this massive weirwood roots. And they're like, I don't know. I can't tear it out. It just gets bigger and wider and stuff. That's what it looks like. Anyway. It goes all the way down. Yes, it does. But yeah, anyway, John's warging is blocked. So is that because he's inexperienced? I don't think so. It's probably wargs. The warg psychic bond is blocked. And the weirwood one is not. Um, but I'd have to re check all Bran's chapters and John's chapters again to really drill in on that. So don't hold me to that if there's something that violates that out there. So very cool. Um, I just, I really like that one, how John is having an, a normal thought. And then he's just kind of like, yeah, I'm hungry. I could really go for like, like a deer or like an elk. I just want to, just want to bite into it and feel the blood. Wait a minute. What's happening? So it's pretty funny. <laughs> yes. Yummy blood. So it tells you the, the warg wolf psychic connection, like, it really is like a fluttering open third eye. You know, you don't have to really stop and dream. You can bounce back and forth. You can share consciousness, essentially. So it's all... I Okay, I think I do have a Weirwood drawing that's kind of like that. Let me see if I can find it real quick. There's a couple of sort of symbolic weirwood depictions that show them like big under the ground. It's crazy to think about because the trees are big as it is, but the roots run deep. And of course, I cannot find it easily now. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. This is by Wolverine. So obviously this is kind of symbolic, heart tree, but it still gives you the idea. Like the organism is under the ground. The tree above is the fruiting body. Exactly. There's one other one. I want to see if I can find, but that's all right. Let's keep it moving. Yeah, Wolverine. Not Wolverine. Wolverine. So, very cool. And let's go on. Let's this one is by Jazrick. There's John with his one eye Odin wound. Like how it's connected to John's eye. It's cool. So let's see. Next quote. And this is moving over to dance. And guys, before we read this one, I actually need to uh, hit the restroom real quick. So let me give you the other funky music and I'll be right back.
Alrighty. I need to go smoke some tea. Is that, oh, make some tea. No, we need to go smoke tea. That'd be cool if we could do that. Um, real quickly here. I'm just going to order myself a little more caffeine because um, I'm out of caffeine and we have many wolf dreams to read. These wolf dreams, they go on when I close my eyes. Every moment of the night, I live a wolfy life. These dreams... Sorry, I just, you know, it's a banger. That'll work, that'll work. Boom, ordered. Bring it to me. DoorDash Life, there it is. Place order. <coughs> All right, I know, I know. Been in my head since Sunday, it's deadly. It's deadly. It's deadly. All right, so Ghost slept at the foot of the bed that night, and for once, John did not dream he was a wolf. So this is, we're here in Dance of Dragons now, and this line is very telling. It's like, ah, John's wolf dreams, it's kind of like once you connect them, you get more. Violet Dragon, thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah, now the, um, once this connection is developed, it, you know, they just keep coming more dreams more vividly and John's kind of almost annoyed by it it's like for once he did not dream of being a wolf because it must be tiring it's like you're tired you're a night's watch captain you're run down you know you're trying to put down mutiny and insurrection and stuff and then you go try to get a good night's sleep and you got to go hunt things like a wolf was thinking about warging dreams. Do the likes of Mel and Barrick don't sleep as an auto ward? On um, oh that okay okay yeah. So the line you really want to bring up here is uh, Melisandre. She talks about dreams as the whisperings of the great other, and she hates sleeping. So I do think that idea goes back to the the notion that when you're dreaming you're potentially more vulnerable to psychic suggestion. And I did want to take a minute to talk about the psychic highway. I, I bring this up a lot, but it bears repeating. There is one psychic realm, and all the magicians are accessing it via different ways. But they can all detect each other. Ghost of High Heart, dreams of all kinds of things going on, including the Red Wedding. Patchface also sees the Red Wedding. Uh, the Undying See the Red Wedding. Uh, Melisandre detects Bran and, and Blood Raven on the psychic network. Makoro sees Euron in his fires. Like, there is one psychic highway, and you can, there's many on ramps, and that's essentially what we're seeing. So, yeah, it makes sense that Melisandre is paranoid about dreams uh, because that is, you know, if you think about it, like, Melisandre's consciousness should reflect the nature of fire for this really to feel right, for Melisandre to feel like a being being taken over by fire, turning into a fire other, like she always wants to be awake, right? Fire is always awake. It never rests. And Beric is like taxed by it. You know, he's like fire consumes. And when there's when it's done, there's nothing left. So we can see George using the sort of emotional extrapolation from the, el the magical elements that people are tapping into. It's part of there being a heavy cost for meth. It's like meth. Yeah. It's always awake. Very alert. We do not endorse illegal drug use on this program, of course. So, uh, yeah. For once, John, um, oh, so, okay, so the Targaryens, this is what I wanted to make a comparison to. Basically, it seems like anybody that is a more magical being, like the wargs or the, the Targaryens having the blood of the dragons, they are all, yeah, myth, not meth, exactly. Um, anybody that's magical seems to have enhanced psychic abilities, like the dragon, the dragon dreamers are not rare. 
A lot of Targaryens have dragon dreams. I bet you they all have some. Some of them probably just don't talk about them or don't think they're anything or don't have them very often, you know? But there's at least a couple every generation. And then with your, with your wargs, we see that all the wargs are psychic. Every one. All the wolves are psychic and all the wargs are psychic. So I really think that George is using magic. Um, he's using, how do I want to say this? It's when I talk about astral projection, astral projection and psychic powers go hand in hand. Astral projection is simply the idea. And we're speaking very loosely here because these are, Things that are probably not... Okay, look. Astral projection in a song of ice and fire essentially means sending your spirit out of your body. Your spirit, your consciousness. Let's not get your soul. Let's not get wrapped up in whatever that is. But your awareness, you're putting it inside of the animal. You're putting it inside of a tree. Brand's consciousness is just flying over Westeros like a comet looking at stuff. Okay. And then we also see the, like, you know, brands stealing Hodor's skin. This is all astral projection. So the other part of it is essentially psychic powers. So almost all of this magic is flowing through the mind. It's very, yeah, it's very, it's very, you know, consistent with 60s and 70s culture. It's consistent with old science fiction like Dune, you know. That's what George is inspired by, so. Let's see here. Let's go. Ghost slept at the foot of the bed. For once, John did not dream he was a wolf. Even so, he slept fitfully, tossing hours, tossing four hours before sliding down into a nightmare. Gilly was in it, weeping, pleading with him to leave her babes alone, but he ripped the children from her arms and hacked their heads off, then swapped their heads around and told her to sew them back in place. I love that dream because it kind of like, that's what it feels like to John. You know, like he didn't kill you grit, but he dreamt that it was his arrow that killed you grit because he feels responsible. And he also dreams of killing you grit with Lightbringer. Okay. So he's, his consciousness is working out that guilt and the same here. It's like he had to do something really tough telling Gilly to swap her baby with Mance's but it was the best thing to do. He's trying to save the lives of these children. So, but he still feels bad. So in his, in his consciousness, it feels like he ripped their heads off and then made her sew them back on. So it's a really good sort of exaggerated personification of John's guilt there. When he woke, he found Ed Tolay looming over him in the darkness of his bedchamber. Lord, it's time. The hour of the wolf. You left orders to be woken. Bring me something hot. John threw off his blankets. Ed was back by the time he had dressed, pressing a steaming cup into his hands. John expected hot mulled wine, and he was surprised to find that it was soup, a thin broth that smelled of leeks and carrots, but seemed to have no leeks or carrots in it. The smells are stronger in my wolf dreams, he reflected, and foods taste richer too. Ghost is more alive than I am. He left the empty cup upon the forge. So... This is a little bit similar. We see this with Bran as well. You know, when he goes back to his body from the wolf, it's like stopping up his ears and eyes and nose. So George is really hinting us with this idea that the animal's senses can just gather a lot more information. Bring me something hot, John threw off his blankets. Yeah, John is, John's got a little bit of that dunk factor, you know. Like, George writes Dunk to be very unaware of the fact that he's seven foot tall of beefcake. And all the women notice this. And even the men have bro crushes on him. Like, Dunk has mad charisma and appeal. And he, does, he has no idea, which is what makes it charming. John's got a little bit of that, too. So. He's just, he's just... He's just walking around being a himbo. That's right. <laughs> All right, so let me see if there's any more. 
Uh, now that's that's about it with the wolf dream here. And now we're getting to. No, we've got we've got one more quote, and then we've got a full on wolf dream. And then we'll get to Arya. He was walking. Okay, so let's see. Let me just go above. The wall loomed on his right as he crossed the yard. Its high ice glimmered palely, but down below was all shadow. At the gate, a dim orange glow shone through the bars where the guards had taken refuge from the wind. John could hear the creak of chains as the winch cage swung and scraped against the ice. Up top, the sentries would be huddling in the warming shed around a brazier, shouting to be heard above the wind. Or else they would have given up the effort and each man would be sunk into his own pool of silence. I should be walking the ice. The wall is mine. He was walking beneath the shell of the Lord Commander's Tower, past the spot where Ygritte had died in his arms. <laughs> Poor John. <laughs> Just... These memories, man. <clears throat> With ghost appeared beside him, his warm breath steaming in the cold. In the moonlight, his red eyes glowed like pools of fire. The taste of hot blood filled John's mouth, and he knew the ghost had killed that night. No, he thought. I'm a man, not a wolf. He rubbed his mouth with the back of a gloved hand and spat. So he's just like <laughs> tasting blood randomly. That would probably be a little bit, you know, like unpleasant. Anyway, um, let's see here. Clyde is still occupied his rooms beneath the rookery. At John's knock, he came shuffling, a taper in his hand. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Let me see where else we get more ghosts. Oh, yeah. A few. So, when Clytus poured, John held the cup with both hands, sniffed the spices, and swallowed. The warmth spread through his chest. He drank again, long and deep, to wash the taste of blood from his mouth. This sounds a little bit like... Well, first of all, it's funny. John, like, the taste of blood... He doesn't really have blood in his mouth. It's from the psychic link, so you probably can't wash that out. You might be able to drown it out with the taste of the wine, but I don't know if this is going to work. It's kind of like when you brush your teeth and then drink a beverage and it doesn't taste quite right. <laughs> so he's... he's um. There's also death for uh, resurrection foreshadowing. So think of John. He's cold, right? And he's got the taste of blood in his mouth. And then warmth is spreading through his chest from the mold wine. The mold wine is used specifically, like it's cooked wine. It's heated wine. And wine is a blood symbol. So when you think about heated blood, this is a relorist fire resurrection symbol. And we explored this in the Melisandre series. The symbol of the mold wine. And also Molly, the night's watchman with flame orange hair. It's, it's really funny. Molly is great. We, we picked up into his fire white foreshadowing. So when John drinks the mulled wine, the warmth spreads through his chest. We should read that as talking about when he's... Fro well, again, my theory that he's going to be frozen by the others before he's fire resurrected. If you don't like the stolen by the others theory, then you might just be thinking about John as being fire resurrected. But at some point, his cold body, which will either be dead or other possessed, will have to be warmed internally by the relorist magic that will spread through him and warm his chest and that will wash out the taste of blood from his mouth because he'll be being resurrected. So the Queen's men are saying that the king beyond the wall died craven, that he died for mercy and denied he was a king. He did. Lightbringer was brighter than I'd ever seen it, as bright as the sun. John raised his cup to Stannis Baratheon and his magic sword. The wine was bitter in his mouth. Like I said, yeah, the taste, there's still that coppery blood taste. Let's see, was that my Red Bull being delivered? It's probably on its way. Ooh, order dropped off. 30 seconds, reading Rhaegar. I'll be right back.
They weren't cold. Mold Red Bull. No, not mold. Room temperature. So I stuck it in the freezer. Moving right along. 298 people on a Thursday afternoon. Thank you, everyone. All right. Where were we? Mold wine. John's resurrected. As soon as he's resurrected, he's looking at... He, he's, he's raised his cup and gives a toast to Lightbringer. That's funny. So he raised a cup of this mold wine, which represents Relorist heated blood, right? So he's like, ah, oh, yes, I'm resurrected by Relore. Here's to Lightbringer. It's pretty funny. So then it keeps on. And, uh, and then, of course, Maester Aemon talks about the Jade Compendium and uh, Azor High, Lightbringer. Tempered with his wife's blood, blah de blah de blah. A sword that makes his own heat would be a fine thing on the wall, John said, as he put aside his wine cup and drew on his black moleskin gloves. A pity the sword Stannis wields is cold. I'll be curious to see how his lightbringer behaves in battle. Thank you for the wine. Ghost with me. John raised the hood of his Yeah, ghost with me, exactly. John and Ghost will be merged. After John is resurrected and John wields Lightbringer. And that's funny, he's like his Lightbringer. It's almost like John's like, wait till he sees my Lightbringer. It's gonna be hot, not cold like his. So that's pretty cool. I dig that. Armory was dark and silent, he hung his sword belt on peg, ghost curled up on the rug and went to sleep. John could not rest. Let's see here. My last friend, John thought ruefully, and I had best outlive you or you'll eat my face as well. <laughs> Ghost did not count. Ghost was closer than a friend. Ghost was part of him. So look, Ghost eating John. He's going to eat John's spirit because John's spirit's going to go in Ghost. And then if Ghost did not count. Ghost was a part of him. So this is all talking about John's death, basically all of Dance with Dragons, John chapters are talking about his death and him going into Ghost and being fire resurrected and being stolen by the others. It's going to be in every chapter because that's what's coming. So. All right. And I believe we've got our last John quote is the actual John Wolf dream legendary stuff. We're familiar with it, but we haven't read it in a while. It's been a long time. So let's race with the white wolf beneath the pale moon. The white wolf raced through a black wood beneath a pale cliff as tall as the sky. The moon ran with him, slipping through a tangle of bare branches overhead across the starry sky. So right here, this is great. This is really cool. Welcome to Squisher, Brian. Really cool symbolism, not even symbolism, let's just say uh, visual imagery. So if you're a wolf loping through the wood, the branches would be racing by, but the moon would seem to be staying still. So it would appear like it was following you. You know what I mean? So that's pretty cool. And that, I love the way that it's described here. And he's running through a black wood beneath a pale cliff. Obviously, that's the wall. Snow, the moon murmured. The wolf made no answer. Snow crunched beneath his paws. The wind sighed through the trees. Far off, he could hear his packmates calling to him, like to like. They were hunting, too. A wild rain lashed down upon his black brother as he tore at the flesh of an enormous goat, washing the blood from his side where the goat's long horn had raked him. So this, by the way, that sentence is a huge sentence. That was confirmation of unicorns on Skagos. That's what that was. An enormous goat with one long horn. These are the enormous horny goats. This is where the phrase enormous horny goats comes from. They're on Skagos. That's George's unicorns. They're enormous goats with big horn. <laughs> so... Pretty cool. 
and there it is. And you can see these things are fierce. Like it's contesting with Shaggy Dog. And Shaggy Dog is a vicious dire wolf. So these horny goats, they are enormous. They're big enough to be ridden potentially by the Skagosi. If the Skagosis are skin changers, which is probably the only way you can ride a horny goat. I don't know. I guess you could tame a horny goat. People keep goats. In another place, his little sister lifted her head to sing to the moon, and a, small, and a hundred small gray cousins broke off their hunt to sing with her. So that's Nymeria, leading the wolf pack in the Riverlands. The hills were warmer where they were and full of food. That's the Riverlands. Many a night his sister's pack gorged on the flesh of sheep and cows and horses, the prey of men, and sometimes even on the flesh of man himself. So again, you see, like, Ghost is just doing an inventory. Like, when Ghost can check in on his wolf brothers and share their consciousness. Yeah, guys, I really think there is a wolf net. It's either that the wolves are tapped into the weirwood net and are using it, or the wolves have their own network, more like in uh, Wheel of Time. Because there's no question, like, these wolves can share each other's consciousness at any time. Like, Ghost is... Ghost can do this whenever. It, John is remarking on it because he's just popping into Ghost's mind. But, like, this is just a standard night for Ghost. He checks in on his brothers. He knows what they're all doing. He knows how far they are. It really makes you understand, like, the Starks will be connected psychically when they're all back in Westeros and they're all embracing their war gifts. Werewolf net. Yep. Seems like, seems like it. Do the wolves awaken the Stark powers? Yes. I think so. Barris Aurelius. It would seem so. Because otherwise it's like, oh, we have six special Starks in one generation. That's weird. It's like, no. All the Starks have the latent ability. It's the wolves that activate it. That seems clearly like what's the best explanation of what's happening. So yeah, now you can see why the Starks have run the north for 8,000 years. This is why. Like, the power of the wolves, it's even more than just the fearsomeness in battle. It's also this ability to, just like the Valerians, like they, those glass candles, Marwyn lecture, and Sam are both like very tuned into this idea. Sam sees it right away. As soon as Marwyn points it out, he's like, think about it. Valerian generals communicating across vast distances. You think that might be handy in a war, Slayer? It's like, yeah, walkie-talkies when no one else has them. So, but those, the wargs have the same advantage. So you can see how this would really help against the others too because in the winter and in the darkness, it's going to be hard to see. The communication between forces could be critical. And the Starks, you know, Bran and John and Arya and possibly Sansa can be communicating with them with each other. Yet yeah, they, they could be using the Weirwood, but have their own channel. I like it. Hard to say if it's um, attached to the Weirwoods or not. Yeah, Arya is still connected to Nymeria from Bravos, far from Westeros Weirwoods. Yeah, but the thing is, this is astral plane stuff, so it's not really. I think the fact that Arya can connect across the sea is really evidence that, like, the Weirwood Net is non-local. This is a psychic plane, so it's not really, like, distance isn't the same. And, like, Ghost calling to John on the bridge there, like, unless Blood Raven's involved, there's no Weirwood action like it's just straight from wolf to john so i really do think the wolves have their own psychic thing going on i also think yeah yeah i definitely think that um the weirwoods are are separate from that yeah i could almost get into a whole different theory i don't want to get get distracted okay back to the chapter 
Snow the moon called down again, cackling. The white wolf padded along the man trail beneath the icy cliff. The taste of blood was on his tongue, and his ears rang to the song of the hundred cousins. The wolf song of Nymeria's pack. So literally, like, Nymeria's pack is howling. Ghost can hear it. And he's like, ah, sweet, sweet wolf music. Oh, it's great. Better than, better than uh, iTunes. Once they had been six, five whimpering blind in the snow beside their dead mother, suckling cool milk from her hard dead nipples while he crawled off alone. Four remained, and one the white wolf could no longer sense. Snow, the moon insisted, and the one they could no longer sense, that's Summer, who's north of the wall. Snow, the moon insisted, the white wolf ran from it, racing toward the cave of night where the sun had hidden, his breath frosting in the air. On starless nights, the great cliff was as black as stone a darkness towering high above the wide world. But when the moon came out, it shimmered pale and icy as a frozen stream. <clears throat> Hard dead nipples. Yeah, sorry, chat. I just went right by that. Didn't even remark. Try not to get demonetized. Um, let's see. The wolf's pelt was thick and shaggy, but when the wind blew along the ice, no fur could keep the chill out. On the other side, the wind was colder still, the wolf sensed. That was where his brother was, the gray brother who smelled of summer. And obviously that's summer, said the chat notice. So again, we see the wall is a psychic barrier. Ghost knows that summer is on the other side of the, of the wall, but cannot sense her. So that's interesting. Um, we probably should think about that as far as what is the purpose of the wall are the others using warg ability when they raise the dead? Are they doing that with a perverted skin changer gift? Because that would, that would explain why the others can't raise the dead on the other side of the wall. Like Othor and Jafer Flowers were whited, and then the Night's Watch carried them across. But we don't see people being raised from the dead south of the wall. So, yeah. It is, there is a bit of a mystery of how, how those two whites did their thing south of the wall. Um, but, it, like, yeah, because I don't... Oh, I can, I can tell you how. It must be through the weirwood net. Yeah, see, I don't think, I don't think skin changing is done through the trees. No, it's just speculating, but yeah, like, Bran is the only one that, like, is connected to the Weirwood. Like, he sees Weirwood in his dreams, even before he goes north of the Wall. And Bloodraven says it's his, you know, Bran's blood that makes him a Greenseer. The Weirwood paste awakens the gifts. But the others aren't Greenseers. So, yeah, it's an interesting question. But I don't think so. I think skin changing is its own thing. And this is, okay, so this is, this backs up my idea that what the green seers are actually doing is skin changing the trees. That's really all they're doing. They're applying the skin changer gift to the weirwoods. And remember, in my opinion, the weirwoods were not created as they currently exist. Green, human green seers didn't used to <laughs> you guys in the chat human green seers weren't always didn't always have access to the weirwood net the whole theory about azor high breaking into the weirwood net and invading it and altering it and kicking the others out and the others are the original tree hive mind that's been evicted is that this you see what i'm saying it's all an invasion so this isn't like Humans going into the trees, basically, like, it seems kind of like Azor High using skin changer magic to invade the trees. And maybe that's the story. Maybe that's essentially what the Green Seers are doing. Because the Green Seer thing is messed up. Like, that's not supposed to be. Humans aren't supposed to be inside the trees. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, Vermeer kind of bounced into the tree and then got bounced out. Yeah. So it's a yeah. So basically, the others are the original hive mind of the Weirwoods in my head canon. Azor High breaks in. He's like this fiery dragon. He burns out everything that's in there. The spirits that are evicted, I believe it's Night's Queen or the Children of the Forest, that give those spirits a home. They give them these new ice bodies so that they have a place to be, essentially. And that's why the children aren't trying to destroy the others. They're trying, ultimately, they're waiting for Bran, and they're going to help try to use Bran, essentially, to put these exercised green seer spirits back in the weirwood net because that's the only way to fix all this problem anyway it's what was got to happen so yeah i think i think skin changing the trees is essentially an abomination and really it's like humans are supposed to skin change animals this is the original magic but some skin changers are so strong that they can skin change trees and that's what Azor Ahai did. This is interesting. I'll have to develop this theory. I'll have to think about this. I'll come back to it. So let's keep reading the chapter. Snow and icicle tumbled from a branch. The white wolf turned and bared his teeth. Snow. His fur rose bristling as the woods dissolved around him. Snow, snow. He heard the beat of wings. Through the gloom, a raven flew. It landed on Jon Snow's chest with a thump and a scrabbling of claws. Snow had screamed into his face. I hear you. The room was dim, his pallet hard. Gray light leaked through the shutters, promising another bleak, cold day. Is this how you woke, Mormont? Get your feathers out of my face. Jon wriggled an arm out from under his blanket to shoo the raven off. It was a big bird, old and bold and scruffy, utterly without fear. Snow had cried, flapping to his bedpost. Snow, snow. John filled his fist with a pillow and let it fly, but the bird took to the air. The pillow struck the wall and burst, scattering snuffing, stuffing everywhere. Um, just as Dolorous Ed Tolay poked his head in through the door. Beg pardon, he said, ignoring the flurry of feathers. Shall I catch my lord's, shall I fetch my lord some breakfast? Corn, cried the raven. Corn, corn. Roast raven, John suggested and half a pint of ale. It's really funny. It's not funny to throw pillows at birds. He could have really hurt that bird. I'm kind of like, I kind of cringe at this scene. For that reason. But this is all just real quickly, foreshadowing of the moon breaking when John is resurrected. John is waking up from his dream. The moon is shouting snow at him. Then it turns into a projectile and lands on his chest. Okay, the other, you know, right before that, there was an icicle falling from a branch. So there's like sharp, frozen things falling from the sky as the moon's like, snow, snow. So you think about icy meteors falling down. And then, of course, John grabs the pillow and throws it against the wall. So now the pillow becomes the meteor. It smashes against the wall which is exactly what's going to happen. And then there's a flurry of feathers. So think of a snowstorm. We've gone through this before, but there it is. John's wolf dream. So it's essentially about his resurrection and the coming long night. That's the foreshadowing here. But basically what's happening is ghost is just hunting and he's checking in with his buddies and there's a full moon. So, the wolf dream itself is pretty tame. It's just very lurid with symbolic import. But it, I think the main thing it shows you is that uh, ghosts or all the wolves are psychically connected in this way and can sort of pop in on each other. So there you, there you have it. So now it's Arya time. Let me go through the rest of my John art. I think I forgot to grab Arya art. I'll have to grab some. So this is Ghost Lee, is the artist. Ghost Lee, drawing ghost. Hyper-realism style. You can zoom in and see like the pommel, 
the leather belt. Ghost's fangs. It's pretty sick. Very handsome John. Looks a little bit like Kit, but not totally. This is uh, by Den Kata5698, who does sort of, again, hyper-realism. So this is totally very unlike Kit Harrington. This is more of a long-faced Stark. It's a Chad Stark-looking Jon Snow, I'll say. So you can see a little bit of that Rhaegar, Rhaegar chin, the Chadness. So... That is cool. That's a good one. This is one of my favorites. This is by John Boccaccio, who's done a couple Ice and Fire calendars. Chad Winterchild. So this is very Norse, John, with the wall, the raven, the wolf, the dragon sword. It's, uh, yeah. So here is John fighting some others. This is Joshua Kairos. No ghost in this one, but I do dig it. It's kind of show inspired. This is by Fadli Ramdani. This is also what I call Beefcake John. This is grown up John, if you will. And there's Very Good Boy. It's Fadli Ramdani. He loves drawing Beefcake John. This is Gabriel Vittoria. Guardian of the Weirwoods at the Wall. Love that. And this is John in the scene where they're finding, uh, where Ghost has found that hand. So this is a good looking young John with the long hair. This is a very good, this totally conjures book vibes here. Do you have any thoughts on Stark men taking leg injuries? John gets an arrow, Ned a break, and Bran without use. Um, thank you, Zach Johnson. Not off the top of my head. I mean, obviously, Bran's it's got a whole thing where he's physically immobile, but psychically mobile. Um, Ned's injury is a Fisher King wound. If you know what the Fisher King sort of thematic symbolism is. John's arrow might be more of the same, but I'd have to look at it. Michael James, appreciate you, buddy. So let's go over to... Oh, we're going through the art. That's right. Just a couple more. This one is Michael C. Hayes. Love the ghost on this one. And then one more, Michael Comark. This is almost like a sketch of the other one that we saw, but it's a cool style. It's, it's got a good, good action here. You can see the wind blowing the hair one direction. It just looks pretty cold. So, yeah, that's what I mean by the Fisher King wound. It's, it has to do with fertility. It's symbolically a, you know, a dick wound, if you will. So let me, real quick, guys, let me grab some Aria artwork. I've got a couple I know I want to use. Sorry, I did not do that ahead of time. So yeah, Aria is a really powerful warg. Um, not just because of the distance, because that distance may not ultimately mean much. Um, again, the psychic highway being potentially non-local. However, she controls the wolf pack like every day in her dreams. And she also skin changes a cat, which is weird. Cats, like, that's probably harder than skin changing a bird, to be honest. Because we're sort of led to believe that, like, the closer to a human consciousness something is, the easier it is for a warg to work with. And cats are, like, pretty alien, so. Naomi Kramer. So 
this is a sick piece of artwork. This is like Ulf Hednar Aria, if you will. And I'll probably go and grab my Red Bull too. I think that's probably about ready. Put it in the freezer. Oh, this is a Clash. Back to Clash. So yeah, when I was started reviewing Arya's chapters for the King Brand series, I was like looking for a foreshadowing of Arya controlling the wolf pack, wolf pack, and then I realized it's that's already happening, already happening. So yeah, let me grab my drink, and I'll just leave Arya up here for you to look at, or I'll give you a different one. This is by Kayla Woodside. So there's the hundred cousins. <clears throat> there's the hundred cousins. The tree's having a rough one. The trees are all having a rough one. And that's kind of the point. Like, you can get to the theories about the weirwoods a couple ways. You know, you can do all this deep dive into the others and figure out that they've been violated by Azor High, but also you can just look at them and be like, wait a minute. The trees look like screaming, burning people with no flesh carved faces, bloody eyes and mouth. They look like bone and blood. <clears throat> They're obviously having a rough one. Children equal giants. Smallest people are the most powerful. What do you mean, Brian? It seems like there's a longer thought there. Because we do have actual giants, of course. And then this is the other super, actually, I'll make this one big too. This is like the, the real size of the dire wolf. Maybe a little bit exaggerated, but they're supposed to be huge. I mean, real dire wolves were bigger than actual wolves, but a Song of Ice and Fire dire wolves, probably even a little bit bigger. So you can see Ari might be able to climb on the back of this one. And Rickon will be riding his wolf. I promise you that. This is by Mon Sterling, also known as Jacqueline Jackson. All right. So this is this is the in the Clash of Kings. This is where Arya is with Yorin and the Night's Watch recruits, and I believe they're in the Holdfast. Yes, they are in the Holdfast. That's correct. And they're getting ready to go to sleep. <clears throat> and everyone's telling Arya to be quiet. I was talking, not bothering. Hot Pie went off and left her alone, and Arya curled up on the pallet. She could hear the crying girl from the far side of the haven. I wish she'd just be quiet. Why does she have to cry all the time? She must have slept, though she never remembered closing her eyes. She dreamed a wolf was howling, and the sound was so terrible that it woke her at once. Arya sat upon her pallet with her heart thumping. Hot Pie, wake up! She scrambled to her feet. Woth, Gendry, didn't you hear? She pulled on a boot. All around her, men and boys stirred and crawled from their pallets. What's wrong? Hot Pie asked. Hear what? Gendry wanted to know. Arya had a bad dream, someone else said. No, I heard it, she insisted. A wolf. Ari has wolves in her head, sneered Lamy. Let them howl, Garen said. They're out there. We're in here. Woth agreed. Never saw no wolf could storm a hold fast. Hot Pie was saying, I never heard nothing. It was a wolf, she shouted at them as she yanked on her second boot. Something's wrong. Someone's coming. Get up. Before they could hoot her down again, the sound came shuddering through the night. Only it was no wolf this time. It was Kurz blowing his hunting horn, sounding danger. In a heartbeat, all of them were pulling on their clothes and snatching for whatever weapons they owned. Arya ran for the gate as the horn sounded again. As she dashed past the barn, Biter threw himself furiously against his chains, and Jake and Agar called out from the back of their wagon. Boy, 
Sweet boy. Is it war? Red war? Boy, free us. A man can fight. Boy. She ignored him and plunged on. By then she could hear horses and shouts beyond the wall. So the rest of the scene is cool, but the wolf dream part is just that. So here, so what ha- what's happened here? <clears throat> this is another silent shout. Arya is connected to her wolf. Her wolf is out there in the countryside. And so she dreams that it must be close. And the wolves are psychic. So, of course, it makes sense that Nymeria would sort of stay close to Arya, right? So what's happened is, essentially, Nymeria woke Arya up. She heard a wolf howling in her dream that wasn't a real sound. It was a dream communication, but it woke her up. And then she thought she had heard a real sound, but it wasn't. It was a dream howl because there are wolves out there in the woods and something is wrong. People are coming to attack her. So you can see that essentially Arya's wolves are looking out for her, even when she doesn't realize that's what's going on. Although she does realize once it happens, she's like, no, something's wrong. That wasn't just a wolf howl. That was a wolf howl of distress. That was an intruder's alert wolf howl. So not only did she hear the howl, she picked up on what it meant. So she's very wolfish. She understood the wolf communication of what it meant. And she was totally sure of it enough to like wake everybody up. So pretty dope. Pretty dope. And this is early on. This is in Clash. So let's go to our next one. And that's why I'm, I'm not just doing wolf dreams. I'm doing all the wolf psychic contact because it really is all of a piece, kind of. The, the bond, the skin changer bond involves wolf dreams as well as psychic contact. You get warnings. You can communicate with each other. It's good for all kinds of shit, so... In the God's Wood, she found her broomstick sword, where she had left it, and carried it to the heart tree. There she knelt. Red leaves rustled. Red eyes peered inside of her. The eyes of the gods. Tell me what to do, you gods, she prayed. For a long moment, there was no sound but the wind and the water, and this is in Harrenhal. Harrenhal God's Wood. Do I have a picture of Arya in the Harrenhal God's Wood? I thought that I did. Must not have pulled it up. We'll go back to this one. Let's see here. No sound but the wind of the water and the creak of leaf and limb. And then far off, beyond the god's wood and the haunted towers and the immense stone walls of Harrenhal, from somewhere out in the world, came the long, lonely howl of a wolf. Goose prickles rose on Arya's skin, and for an instant she felt dizzy. Then, so faintly, it seemed as if she heard her father's voice. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives, he said. So, I just want to pause right here and ask you, what, this is another one you got to read it closely. Think about what's actually happening here, okay? Arya's in the God's Wood. She prays to the gods. And then beyond the God's Wood, beyond the walls of Harrenhal, which Harrenhal is a huge castle, out and from the world, the lonely howl of a wolf. Like, I don't think that's an actual wolf howl. I think this is another psychic wolf howl. Because what happens right afterwards? She feels dizzy for a second, and goose prickles form on her skin. And then she starts hearing the voice of her father. So I don't know how much the weirwood is involved here. Obviously, she's literally in front of the weirwood, praying to the weirwood. So we can imagine Bran or Blood Raven or the old gods on the other end of the call, for sure. So that's this wolf howl comes, and it sort of triggers her into a euphoric state of dizziness. And then she hears 
the voice of her father. So it's almost like a weird net memory and not just a regular memory. And it's exactly the thing she needs to hear, right? It's this line of wisdom. So it's, again, Martin writing very subtly so that you're not sure exactly what's going on. But the idea that the wolf howls, then she gets dizzy, and then she starts hearing voices like something psychic is going on here. And yes, seems like Eddard is in the weirwood net, kind of. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about the Stark spirits being called back to the crypts. It's not just the statues that are there. If the Stark bloodline is tied to the, you know, is originally a green seal bloodline, the original kings of winter are down there sitting on petrified weirwood thrones. Their spirits are in the weirwood net. And so that, yeah. That could create a situation where the Starks, even though Ned isn't an activated skin changer or green seer, his spirit does seem to go back to the crypts. I have to think about this more. Man, we're going to... As many crypts videos as you do, there's always new ideas. There's always another crypts live stream coming, man. Maybe we'll do a new one for Halloween. We got Halloween coming. <clears throat> All right, guys. Cool. So, and thank you, mods. Appreciate y'all. Okay. When the snow fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies. But there is no pack, she whispered to the weirwood. Bran and Rickon were dead, and the Lannisters had Sansa. John gone to the wall. I'm not even me now. I'm Nan. You are Arya of Winterfell, daughter of the North. You told me you could be strong. You have the wolf blood in you. The wolf blood. Arya remembered now. I'll be as strong as Rob. I said I would. She took a deep breath, then lifted her broomstick in both hands and brought it down across her knee. It broke with a loud crack, and she threw the pieces aside. I am a dire wolf, and done with wooden teeth. <clears throat> so she's just made a decision, and what she does that night is she goes and finds Gendry and recruits him for her plot to break out of Harrenhal. So she's done being, she's done playing pranks and killing people here and there. You know, she's ready now to break out. And so this is when the, the hot weasel soup rebellion takes shape and all that stuff. But it starts with this decision. So this emotional turning point comes from this dream contact with the weirwood. This is very comparable to Daenerys in her third chapter in A Game of Thrones, where her experience with the Dothraki completely re returns around after this dragon dream that she has, where the dragon fire scours her clean and she feels new and fierce. And then she wakes up and begins to embrace and master riding. She gains power in her relationship with Drogo, et cetera, et cetera, and begins to really separate from Viserys with the whole... <laughs> so you've decided to join the Dothraki reality show. <laughs> Um, so this is very similar. Arya's got this turning point that comes from this psychic contact with first the wolf and then the spirit of her father or the memory of her father or the weirwood net using the voice of her father could be any of those things. But it's cool that, um, it's cool that, uh, and no, I don't think the statues are going to rise. I still don't think that. I understand why people think that, but that's kind of silly. If you think about it, it's kind of silly that the statues are going to... I mean, it's just... It's not going to happen, guys. I don't, I don't really understand. Like, that's one where, like, yeah, I get the symbolism. The symbolism... Symbolism could imply that the actual flappy, flappy dragons flew down from the moon to the earth. That's what the story says. The meteors are like dragons. So why do I think it's meteors that flew down to the earth and not dragons? Well, because dragons flying down to the earth from the moon would be silly. <laughs> so I do feel like the symbolism can be a hall of mirrors. And you do have to use like story sense to try to decide what the literal manifestation is going to turn out to be. And again, all theory crafting, so nobody's wrong until it happens. Um, but I just think 
I just think the idea of the statues getting up is like really silly. That's not it. And I think that when we read the, um, the scene just this past Sunday, when uh, the Ironborn came and invaded Winterfell, which I'm going to go back to and scrub, the wolves that were trapped in the Godswood seem to represent the spirits trapped inside the statue. And there we went into all that, but they're in the Godswood and they're in the castle and they're trying to get out. And essentially that's what I think is that the spirits are in the statues still because the oldest statues are petrified weirwood thrones. Like, I don't think, I don't think the Stark statues that we've seen, like Edric Snowbeard's spirit isn't coming back. But the original Stark Kings of Winter, who were green seers, whose thrones are weirwood in the lowest levels, those spirits could come back in spirit form, guys. Spirit form. Now, any resurrected white is like a moving statue, right? Cold hands' hands are hard as stone. So John, if John is frozen by the others and then filled with Relora's spirit, I think he'll end up like his dream, armored in black ice, but with a burning sword. So he, he'll literally have like a cold body and like fiery eyes or something like that. He will be kind of statue-like. But yeah. Anyways. Sorry, I just had to say that. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, this is a really cool scene. It's a turning point for Arya. And it's interesting how the wolf howl is the thing that kicks Arya into this little psychic reverie. Kind of like when Bran tapped Jon on the forehead with his three-eyed tree. Yeah. And uh, I've made this point before, but real quick, the fact that Bran appears as a three-eyed weirwood tree to Jon helps explain why blood raven doesn't know what brand means when brand's like are you the three-eyed crow and brand and blood raven's like uh I used to be a night's watch crow like i don't think you're necessarily in control of how you appear in dreams to people i don't know that brand intended to appear to john as a three-eyed weirwood tree he just saw john in his dreams but that's how john perceived his spirit in the spirit world when melisandre sees john in the spirit, in her flame vision, he's a wolf and then a man and then a wolf and then a man again. That's a symbolic representation of what's going to happen to John because Mel's seeing the future. And the dreams all appear through symbols. So, yeah, Brand appears as a three eyed weirwood tree because he's using his third eye and he's a green seer. So, Blood Raven appears as a three eyed crow because he's flying around, he's more identified with the bird than the tree because he's blood raven and because he's inside of Bran's dream. So he's just like a little presence in the dream. He's a bird, right? I don't know. That's how, that's how it works. So also the other part is that, is that in the dream, uh, dream Ned reminds Arya that she has the wolf blood. So comparable to the blood of the dragon, like the wolf blood, we're introduced to it as a saying, like, oh yeah, Arya, Bran, and Lyanna, they're wild, they have the wolf blood. Um, but it actually is also, there is a magical thing where the Starks have this skin change or bloodline. They are literally wolf spirits, kind of. Not literally, sorry. Figuratively. But they are literally connected to wolves. Yeah, the Titan of Bravos isn't going to come alive either. <clears throat> Shout out to Jason and the Argonauts. All right. So let's go. Oh, no. Let's see. Oh, okay. That night, there's a little bit more in this scene. That night she lay in her narrow bed upon the scratchy straw, listening to the voices of the living and the dead whisper and argue as she waited for the moon to rise. They were the only voices she trusted anymore. She could hear the sound of her own breath and the wolves as well, a great pack of them now. They are closer than the one I heard in the Godswood, she thought. They are calling to me. Yeah, because the one in the Godswood was distant. Like, it was not even necessarily a physical wolf howl. I don't think. But So the rest of this is 
Arya plotting and stuff. So we'll skip to the next one here. That was the wolf component. I still got that heart in my head. I didn't even think about the fact that it's heart, like heart tree. <laughs> I should take a look at the lyrics. It might be ripe for a, uh, a Mad Libsing. I'd say it definitely is. In case you didn't know, I've done seven out of 10 songs on the Weezer Blue album, as far as turning them into, uh, it's not just My Name is Fagon. My name is Fagon, which is obviously my name is Jonas. If you don't know Weezer Blue album. Anyway, where were we? So this is, oh, Arya and Gendry are on the run in the Riverlands. So, oh, this is when she used the wolves to kill the bloody mummers. That's what this is. That's what it is. Yeah, Weezer Blue Album is one of the greatest albums of all time, period. <laughs> when Mel's face is described as heart-shaped, is it like the physical organ or the popular heart shape? This is why I made you a mod to Ami. Can you imagine somebody's face looking like the organ? It's like all lopsided and stuff. Nah, I'd... Do Disney musical songs as the Song of Ice and Fire, you coward. That would be Elisa Patience's domain. Oh, I did Surf Wax America. Surf Wax USA. Yeah, I did that. Did that. I did, uh... Oh, man. I'm, I might even be tempted to sing that one at the end. I could do that one acapella. That one's good. It's perhaps my favorite. Okay. Remind me, Carl Karsnark. Or Sean. Either one of you guys remind me. Sean, I should mod you too. What am I doing here? Let's give you some respect. I know Sean in real life. I know he's a good dude. I trust you. Save. Might just have to get Sean on a live stream. He's a funny man. Anyway. It was no good arguing. Arya realized Gendry had the right of it. The mummers will need to sleep too, she told herself, hoping it was true. Oh, that's right. Remember, they were, Arya was like, we got to keep going. And then like, they're all asleep on their feet and the one horse is just turning in a circle and the other one's eating uh, grass or whatever. So, um, but Gendry's like, okay, we got to stop and sleep, dude. And so she's like, Gendry had the right of it. The mummers will need to sleep too, she told herself, hoping it was true. She was so weary, it was a struggle even to get down from the saddle, but she remembered to hobble her horse before finding a place beneath a beech tree. The ground was hard and damp. She wondered how long it would be before she slept in a bed again with no hot food and a fire to, or with hot food and a fire to warm her. The last thing she did before closing her eyes was think about murder. No, she did. Was unsheath her sword and lay it down beside her. Sir Gregor, she whispered, yawning. Dunson, Poliver, Raph the Sweetling, the Tickler, oh, the Tickler, the Hound, so this is Arya. I just, you gotta love her, man. She falls asleep. She's never too tired. I will, okay, Cucumber. I will. Just at the end of the stream. I don't want to stop the momentum. But I will, I will give you some Weezer at the end, if you guys remind me. <clears throat> so yeah, Arya, never too tired to think about murder as she drifts to sleep. Her dreams were red and savage. The mummers were in them, four at least. A pale Lyseni and a dark, brutal axeman from Ib the scarred Dothraki horse lord called Igo, and a Dornishman whose name she never knew. On and on they came, riding through the rain in rusted mail and wet leather, swords and axe clanking against their saddles. They thought they were hunting her. She knew with all the strange, sharp certainty of dreams, but they were wrong. She was hunting them. She was no little girl in the dream. She was a wolf, huge and powerful, and when she emerged from beneath the trees in front of them and bared her teeth in a low rumbling growl, she could smell the rank stench of fear from the horse and man alike. The Lyseni's mount reared and screamed in terror, and the others shouted at one another in man talk, but before they could act, the other wolves came hurtling from the darkness and the rain, a great pack of them, gaunt and wet and silent. 
The fight was short but bloody. The hairy man went down as he unslung his axe. The dark one died stringing an arrow, and the pale man from Lice tried to bolt. Her brothers and sisters ran him down, turning him again and again, coming at him from all sides, snapping at the legs of his horse, and tearing the throat from the rider when he came crashing to the earth. Only the belled man stood his ground. His horse kicked in the head of one of her sisters, and he cut another almost in half with his curved, silvery claw as his hair tinkled softly. So that's the Dothraki, obviously. Filled with rage, she leapt onto his back, knocked him headfirst from his, from his saddle. So, okay, guys, hold on just a second. The wolf just leapt onto the man's back, on horseback, knocked him from his saddle. Her jaws locked on his arm as they fell, her teeth sinking through the leather and wolf and soft fl- or wool and soft flesh. When they landed, she gave a savage jerk with her head and ripped the limb loose from the shoulder. Exulting, she shook it back and forth in her mouth, scattering the warm red droplets amidst the cold black rain. Okay. So, um, that was savage. Like, this, here's a preview of the winds of winter. This is what it's going to be like. Arya's wolf got pissed. She saw one of her sisters go down, and then she just, like, loses it, leaps over the horse's rump onto the back, knocks the guy off, grabs his arm as they're falling, and then tears the arm out of its socket. I don't know if that's really something a wolf could do in one pull like that, but um, these wolves can, so that's... <laughs> Dude... Yeah, so, um, now there's only four dudes here, um, but they didn't stand a chance. Like, most of them didn't even get out their weapons, <laughs> okay? So, this is how wolves hunt, of course. They come at you from the darkness. They are quiet. They can sense you before you sense them. <laughs> so, anyway, just, yeah, that was friggin' savage. Yeah, so this is this is what's coming. And you got to think, this wolf pack is constantly, like, growing in size. There's no telling how big it will be. Um, and Bran will also be involved. I really do think Bran will be hopping around uh, from wolf to wolf as well. Sean MacArthur said, new, new moderator Sean MacArthur says, Wolf bite strength is terrifying. There you go. And wolves are, in general, like, bigger and more terrifying than you think, if you ever see one in person. Hopefully... Uh, not in well I was going to say in a zoo but I don't want wolves to be in a zoo so hopefully you see a wolf in a safe way that doesn't involve you getting eaten I don't know good documentary or something anyways moving right along just savage and then like shakes the arm around like a toy <laughs> it's pretty funny pretty fucking metal too All right. This is at um, one of the inns in the Riverlands when she's with the uh, the band without brothers or the Brotherhood without banners, whatever. The band without brothers. It's a girl. Ba- it's a girl band, rock girl chick band, or just dudes that aren't related to. Me. Anyways. The sleeping room was at the top of the stairs, under the eaves. Maybe the peach had no... Okay, so they're at the peach, which is a establishment of the night, if you will. But there was only one to spare for the likes of them. There was no, the peach had no lack of beds, but there was only one to spare for the likes of them. Right, because all the beds are being used, if you know what I mean. <laughs> It was a big bed, though. It filled the whole room just about, and the musty straw-stuffed mattress looked large enough for all of them. Just now, though, she had it to herself. Her real clothes were hanging on a peg from the wall, on the wall, between Gendry's stuff and Lem's. Arya took off the linen and lace, pulled her tunic over her head, climbed into the bed, and burrowed under the blankets. Queen Cersei, she whispered into the pillow. King Joffrey, Sir Illyn, Sir Marin, Dunson, Raff, and Polliver. The Tickler, the Hound, Sir Gregor the Mountain... 
She liked to mix up the order of the names sometimes. It helped, helped her remember who they were and what they'd done. Maybe some of them are dead, she thought. Maybe they're in the iron cages someplace, and the crows are picking out their eyes. Bloodthirsty little Arya. Sleep came as quick as, uh, as quick as she closed her eyes. She dreamed of wolves that night, stalking through a wet wood with the smell of rain and rot and blood thick in the air. Only they were good smells in the dream, and Arya knew she had nothing to fear. She was strong and swift and fierce, and her pack was all around her, her brothers and her sisters. They ran down a frightened horse together, tore its throat out and feasted. And when the moon broke through the clouds, she threw back her head and howled. But when the day came, she woke to the barking of dogs. Less exciting. Arya sat up, yawning. Gendry was stirring on her left and Lem Lemoncloak snoring loudly to her right, but the baying outside all but drowned him out. There must be half a hundred dogs out there. She crawled from under the blanket and hopped over Lem, Tom, and Jack Be Lucky to the window. When she opened the shutters wide, wind and wet and cold all came flooding in together. The day was gray and overcast. Down below in the square, the dogs were barking, running in circles, growling and howling. There was a pack of them, great black mastiffs and lean wolfhounds, and black and white sheepdogs and kinds Arya did not know. Shaggy brindled beasts with long yellow teeth. Between the inn and the fountain, a dozen riders sat astride their horses, watching the townsman open the fat man's cage and tug his arms until his swollen corpse spilled out onto the ground. The dogs were at him at once, tearing chunks of flesh off his bones. So this is when they bring in the hound. Yeah, okay. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much, Ian. Appreciate the gifted memberships. So this is just a short little wolf dream. I guess there's not really a, a huge takeaway from it. It's just more continued contact. It's in the Riverlands here. It continues in Bravos. It's just, it's easy to miss it. That's all. But Arya is basically in Nymeria all the time. And it's awesome. It's kind of, it must be therapeutic for her. Because in, in real life, she doesn't have much power to take revenge. But in these dreams, she is a bloodthirsty wolf, and she has no fear, and she rules. Rules the woods. And I think she's definitely taking strength from that. Because she's like, oh, I'm done with wooden teeth. I'm a dire wolf. So just like Danny, drawing personal strength and resilience from her inner dragon, Arya's doing the exact same thing. Wolf dreams. All right. Let me give you some fresh artwork, and I'm going to praise Garth just off camera very quickly. This one is by Adriano Batista. So obviously a little bit aged up Aria, but uh, whatever. This is when she's coming back to Westeros. Uh, post five year gap, perhaps. I'm actually going to go get Cleo. She's suffered enough. I'll be right back.
And we're back. It's Cleo, everyone. Hi, good girl. Are you happy to be out? Yes, she is. She's very happy. All right. Come here, good girl. Oh, so oh, she's so happy to see me. She's She likes to sit on my knee and get pets, so that's what's happening. There you go, good girl. All right, let's keep reading. Hebity bee. Oh, no, girl, no. She just grabbed my bud. Cleo, that was my bud. Step up. It's fine, I have more. She savaged it like a dire wolf. Come here. See, Cleo likes the stems, they're crunchy. So to her, all that other stuff is just in the way of the stem. <laughs> anyway, she could feel the hole inside her every morning when she woke. It wasn't hunger. Though sometimes there was that too. It was a hollow place, an emptiness where her heart had been, where her brothers had lived and her parents. Her head hurt too, not as bad as it had at first, but still pretty bad. Arya was used to that, though, and at least the lump was going down. But the hole inside her stayed the same. The hole will never feel any better, she told herself when she went to sleep. Some mornings, Arya did not want to wake at all. She would huddle beneath her cloak with her eyes squeezed shut and try to will herself back to sleep. If the hound would only have left her alone, she would have slept all day and night. Oh, sorry, girl. She's distracted by the open drawer. You can't get in the drawer. Come here. You can't go in the drawer. And dreamed. That was the best part, the dreaming. She dreamed of wolves most every night. A great pack of wolves, with her at the head. She was bigger than any of them, stronger, swifter, faster. She could outrun horses and outfight lions. When she bared her teeth, even... And that's probably Lannister lions there. <clears throat> when she bared her teeth, even men would run from her. Her belly was never empty for long, and her fur kept her warm, even when the wind was blowing cold. And her brothers and sisters were with her, many and more of them, fierce and terrible, and hers. They would never leave her. <clears throat> but if her nights were full of wolves, her days belonged to the dog. And I think that's it. I think it goes back on to Arya's chapter. Hot Pie and Gendry had left her just as soon as they could, and Lord Beric and the outlaws only wanted to ransom her, just like the Hound. None of them wanted her around. They were never my pack. Not even Hot Pie and Gendry. I was stupid to think so. Just a stupid little girl and no wolf at all. So, I think she's wrong about Hot Pie and Gendry. I think they were a pack. But she'll, she'll, she'll come to terms with that eventually. Um, but yeah, this is just more... One thing I want to say about... Yes, it, Arya, it is, Arya's definitely got some depression and PTSD and stuff. I am happy for Nymeria, though, because it was so sad when Arya was throwing rocks at her and trying to chase her off. Super, super, super sad. Yeah, there's a lot of trauma and disassociation stuff going on. I agree, Northern Tommy. Um, but at least Nymeria is living her best life. It was very sad to be separated from Arya, but as we can see, they're not really separated. And... Nymeria is now the head of this giant wolf pack. Oh, they're definitely going to reunite. Winter Ashara. Have no fear. And then check out my King Brand series. I think the first one talks about Arya. But yes, this wolf pack stuff is going somewhere. Like, she's going to come back to... When she shows up in Westeros, the wolves will be waiting for her. The first time she comes near the woods... They might be on the damn shore, but I, I suspect they'll be in the first clump of woods that she comes to because they can detect distance. The wolves know how far they are from each other. So Nymeria will definitely know when Arya comes back. And this is the whole point of the earlier scene that we read. I guess I didn't make this clear. Arya and Gendry and Hot Pie were fleeing Hall. The bloody mummers were tracking them down and definitely would have caught them. And Arya and Gendry can barely know, like, which direction to go in. They're kids. And they're being tracked by seasoned 
combat veterans who know how to track and have faster horses. They definitely would have been caught. But Nymeria is working to protect Arya. Like, they're psychically connected. Nymeria knows that Arya is trying to escape. She knows what's going on. She knows that the Mummers are chasing her. And so Nymeria took her whole wolf pack and ate those Mummers so that Nymeria could escape. That's how it happened. You could say that Arya did it with Nymeria, but basically Nymeria did that which is why it kind of makes sense to think about that psychic shout that Arya hears in the Harrenhal Godswood as Nymeria trying to prick her ears up, be like, hey, it's time to, time to man up. Let's go. Make a plan. I've got a whole wolf pack. Cleo, i got a whole wolf pack out here, you know? <clears throat> so, yeah. Just want to make that clear. It's, it's easy to miss when you read the first time or two that like her escape from Harrenhal is only facilitated by those wolves. And so very clear that Nymeria, the wolf, knows when Arya needs her and is still looking out for her. Let's see. Oh, uh, she, um, right. So she's boiling wine here to treat the hound's wounds right before she leaves the hound. And she's got this, uh, cup of wine. And it says her knuckles brush the steel the first time she filled the cup, burning her so badly she got blisters. Arya had to bite her lip to keep from screaming. The hound used the stick for the same purpose, clamping it between his teeth as she poured. She did the gash in his thigh first, then the shallower cut on the back of his neck. Oh, God, that must have hurt. Oh. Sandor coiled his right hand into a fist and beat against the ground when she did the leg. When it came to the neck, he bit the stick so hard it broke, and she had to find him a new one. She, <laughs> she could see the terror in his eyes. Yeah, poor hound. He's got to feel the feeling of being burned. Even Hound, you can feel sorry for him here. This is, yeah, love the medical scenes. They're great, aren't they? She could see the terror in his eyes. Turn your head. She trickled the wine down over the raw red flesh where his ear had been, and the fingers of brown blood and red wine crept over his jaw. He did scream then, despite the stick. Then he passed out from the pain. Arya figured the rest out by herself. She fished the strips they'd made of the squire's cloak out of the bottom of the helm and used them to bind the cuts. When she came to the ear, she had to wrap up half his head to stop the bleeding. By then, dusk was settling over the trident. She let the horses graze, then hobbled them for the night and made herself as comfortable as she could in a niche between two rocks. The fire burned a while and died. Arya watched the moon through the branches overhead. Sir Gregor the Mountain, she said softly, Dunson, Raft the Sweetling, Sir Illyn, Sir Marin, Queen Cersei. It made her feel queer to leave out Polliver and Tickler. And Joffrey, too. She was glad when he was dead, but she wished she could have been there to see him die. Or maybe kill him herself. Polliver said that Sansa killed him, and the imp. Could that be true? The imp was a Lannister, and Sansa... I wish I could change into a wolf and grow wings and fly away. Because remember, that's the tale that Arya heard about Sansa is that she killed Joffrey and then turned into a bat wolf and flew out of the tower. If Sansa was gone too, there were no more Starks but her. Jon was on the wall a thousand leagues away, but he was a snow. And these, these different aunts and uncles the Hound wanted to sell her to, they weren't Starks either. They weren't wolves. And that's Tully she's talking about. Sandor moaned and she rolled onto her side to look at him. She had left his name out too, she realized. Why had she done that? She tried to think of Micah, but it was hard to remember what he looked like. She hadn't known him long. All he ever did was play swords with me. The Hound, she whispered, and Valor Margulis. Maybe he'd be dead by morning. But when the pale dawn light came filtering through the trees, it was him who woke her with the toe of his boot. She had dreamed she was a wolf again, 
chasing a riderless horse up a hill with a pack behind her, but his foot brought her back just as they were closing for the kill. The hound was still weak, every movement slow and clumsy. Let's see here. Hound falls off his horse, a bit like Drogo. Arya puts him against a tree. Thinks about killing him. He asks her to do it, and she doesn't. And he says, a real wolf would finish a wounded animal. And then she thinks, maybe some real wolves will find you. Maybe they'll smell you when the sun goes down. Then he would learn what wolves did to dogs. You shouldn't have hit me with an axe, she said. You should have saved my mother. She turned her horse and rode away from him and never looked back once. Let me see if there's any more wolf dreams here. I don't think so. I think she goes to the docks and finds her ship. Nope, that's it. Just a tiny little wolf dream. I have so many years of videos to pour over. Thank you. Hey, Blarg the Zombie, welcome. So then she gets on the, uh, yeah, she gets on the boat at the end of this chapter. So I guess, yeah, not a big one there, just highlighting the constant wolf connection. Because you didn't realize there were so many, right? In the Riverlands, there's like four. So now we're going to feast. Does not give the gift of mercy. Didn't deserve it. Oh, this is actually dance. Is it? No, it's feast. This should be feast. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, Kindle shuts down a lot. It's a little, little buggy. Okay, let's try again. Feast for crows. Ha! <laughs> Okie doke. Come on, Kindle. <laughs> Two shutdowns in a row. Feast for crows, eh? Okay, that's exactly what was there. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever, Kindle. The wafer and the kindly man were not the only servants of the many-faced god. From time to time, others would visit the house of black and white. The fat fellow had fierce black eyes, a hooked nose, and a wide mouth full of yellow teeth. The stern face never smiled. His eyes were pale, his lips full and dark. Wait, was that Illyrio? The fat fellow had black eyes, a hooked nose, and a wide mouth full of yellow teeth. No. No. The stern face never smiled. His eyes were pale, his lips full and dark. The handsome man. Oh, that's Roose Bolton. Pale eyes, lips full and dark. Yeah. Oh, no. Ramsey's lips are like two worms. They're thin, not full. The handsome man had a beard of different color every time she saw him and a different nose, but he was never less than comely. Those three came most often, but there were others. The squinter, the lordling, the starved man. One time the fat fellow and the squinter came together. Uma sent Arya to pour for them. When you are not pouring, you must stand as still as if you had been carved of stone, the kindly man told her. Can you do that? Yes. Before you can learn to move, you must learn to be still. Sirio Forel had taught her long ago at King's Landing, and she had. She had served as Roose Bolton's cupbearer at Harrenhal, and he would flay you if you spilled his wine. Good, the kindly man said. It would be best if you were blind and deaf as well. You may hear things, but you must let them pass in one ear and out the other. Do not listen. Arya heard much and more that night, but almost all of it was in the tongue of Bravos, and she hardly understood one word in ten. Still a stone, she told herself. 
The hardest part was struggling not to yawn. Before the night was done, her wits were wandering. Standing there with a flagon in her hands, she dreamed she was a wolf, running free through a moonlit forest with a great pack howling at her heels. Are the other men all priests? she asked the kindly man the next morning. Were those their real faces? What do you think, child? She thought, no. Is Jake and Hagar a priest, too? Do you know if Jake and will be coming back to Bravos? Who? he said, all innocent. Jake and Hagar! He gave me the iron coin. I know no one by this name, child. <laughs> I asked him how he changed his face, and he said it was no harder than taking a new name, if you knew the way. Did he? Will you show me how to change my face? If you wish. He cupped her chin in his hand and turned her head. Puff up your cheeks and stick out your tongue. Arya puffed up her cheeks and stuck out her tongue. There, your face has changed. <laughs> That's not how I meant. Jacob used magic. All sorcery comes at a cost, child. Years of prayer and sacrifice and study are required to work a proper glamour. Years, she said, dismayed. If it were easy, all men would do it. You must walk before you run. Why use a spell where mummer's tricks will serve? I don't know any mummer's tricks either. Then practice making faces. Anyways, it goes on and on. Let's see if there's any... Um, It's just delightfully funny. Let's see here. Any more wolf action? No, nah, we're going to the next one. It's time to go to Brusco's. I think this is a pretty good one here. By the time the three of them climbed down the ladder from the room beneath the eaves, Brusco and his sons were out in the boat and on the little canal behind the house. Brusco barked at the girls to hurry, as he did every morning. His sons helped Talia and Bria onto the boat. It was Kat's task to untie them from the piling, toss the rope to Bria, and shove the boat away from the dock with a booted foot. Brusco's sons leaned into their poles. <clears throat> Kat ran and leapt across the widening gap between dock and deck. After that, she had nothing to do but sit and yawn for a long while as Brusco and his sons pushed them through the pre-dawn gloom, wending down a confusion of small canals. The day looked to be a rare one, crisp and clear and bright. Bravos only had three kinds of weather. Fog was bad, rain was worse, and freezing rain was the worst. But every so often would come a morning when the dawn broke pink and blue, then the air was sharp and salty. Those were the days Cat loved the best. Blah, 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 blah. When they reached the broad, straight waterway that was the long canal, they turned south for the fish market. Kat sat with her legs crossed, fighting a yawn and trying to recall the details of her dream. I dreamed I was a wolf again. She could remember the smells best of all. Trees and earth, her pack brothers, the scents of horse and deer and man, each different from the others, and the sharp, acrid tang of fear, always the same. Some nights the wolf dreams were so vivid that she could hear her brothers howling even as she woke and once Brea had claimed that she was growling in her sleep as she thrashed beneath her covers. She thought that was some stupid lie till Talia said it too. And remember Bran also was dealing with that in the second book, like all the people in Winterfell know that Bran has nightmares and howls in his dreams or growls in his dreams or whatever. I should not be dreaming wolf dreams, the girl told herself. I'm a cat now, not a wolf. I'm cat of the canals. The wolf dreams belonged to Arya of House Stark. Try as she might, though, she could not rid herself of Arya. It made no difference whether she slept beneath the temple or in the little room beneath the eaves with Brusco's daughters. The wolf dreams still haunted her by night, and sometimes other dreams as well. The wolf dreams were the good ones. Girl. In the wolf dreams, she was swift and strong, running down her prey with her pack at her heels. It was the other dream she hated, the one where she had two feet instead of four, and that one she was always looking for her mother, stumbling through a wasted land of mud and blood and fire. It was always raining in that dream, and she could hear her mother screaming, but a monster with a dog's head would not let her go save her. In that dream she was always weeping, like a frightened little girl. Cats never weep, she told herself, no more than wolves do. It's just a stupid dream. 
So let's see here if there's any more wolf dreamness. I think it's just that. Howling in, howling in the dark. Must be a fun person to sleep next to. And then she skin changes the cat as well. But it doesn't really... That's just a very short scene. It's basically she just uses the cat to know that it's the kindly man who's hitting her when she's blind. But I'm just skimming real quick here. Cockles and clams, blah de blah de blah. Oh, you want to step up? Okay. What do you want? Okay, so up next is... Okay, I see where you want to go. Oh, this is dance. Okay. Dance of Dragons. Boom. Her nights were lit by distant stars and the shimmer of moonlight on snow. But every dawn, she woke to darkness. So those are, that's the wolf dream, the snow and the moonlight and what, distant stars. So it's Westerosi stars. She opened her eyes and stared up blind at the black that sh shrouded her. Her dream already fading. So beautiful. She licked her lips, remembering. The bleeding of the sheep, the terror in the shepherd's eyes. The sound the dogs had made as she killed them one by one. The snarling of her pack. Game had become scarcer since the snows began to fall, but last night they had feasted. Lamb and dog and mutton and the flesh of man. Some of her little gray cousins were afraid of men, even dead men, but not her. Meat was meat and men were prey. She was the night wolf but only when she dreamed. So kind of interesting, when John tastes the blood in his mouth, he's like, ah, oh, get it out. Arya's like, savoring it. Even as a human, she's savoring, licking her lips, remembering, so beautiful. Oh God, it was just beautiful. I mean, she's so wolfish, dude. Arya is like, you know, we talk about Bran getting lost in the wolf and stuff like that. Like, Arya doesn't have a Jojen to, like, caution her. She just gives herself over to wolfiness. She's not trying to mark trees or anything. She's not trying to remember that she's a girl. In fact, her girl memories are traumatic. So when she's in the wolf dream, it's, again, therapeutic for her. She's powerful and without fear. And she embraces it fully. So... Yeah, she she is like just wolfish as hell. Very very interesting. Yeah, and John is not. He's more anchored to the realm of men as a Night's Watch commander. Arya's an orphan who's obsessed with revenge. It's totally different. So let's see here. Blind girl rolled up on her side, she gets up. She padded to her basin on a small pair of on small bear calloused feet, silent as a shadow. Sir Gregor, she thought. Dunson, Raph the Sweetling, Sir Illyn, Sir Marin, Queen Cersei. Her morning prayer. Or was it? No, she thought, not mine. I'm no one. That is the night wolf's prayer. Someday she will find them, hunt them, smell their fear, taste their blood. Someday. So yeah, she's thinking like a wolf, even while awake. Then it goes on into the chapter and she is the blind girl and this is the one where at the end she uses uh, the cat let's see here lion games with the waif she's learning how to navigate the tunnels 
Her other senses are becoming stronger. And I think that is that. Yep. Oh, there's one bit here, I guess. Not for me. Her nights were bathed in moonlight and filled with the song of her pack, with the taste of red meat torn off the bone, with the warm, familiar smells of her gray cousins. Only during the days was she alone and blind. So again, it's just, just what I said, emphasizing how she's powerful in the dream, but weak and small in real life, but becoming stronger by her connection to the wolves. Hello, wolfish. Oh, this is Winds of Winter. Okay, sorry. So I've, I've just got this whole quote pulled from her Winds of Winter chapter. So she's still in Bravos, uh, but now she's posing as somebody else, basically. I won't spoil the chapter, but there is a Winds of Winter Aria chapter out there. It is in Bravos. And she has a wolf dream in it. And it says, The smell of blood was heavy in her nostrils. Or was that her nightmare lingering? She had dreamed of wolves again, of running through some dark pine forest, with a great pack at her heels, hard on the scent of prey. And then later it says, In Septon dreams, she took a breath to quiet the howling in her heart, trying to remember more of what she dreamt, but most of it was gone already. There had been blood in it, though, and a full moon overhead, and a tree that watched her as she ran. So that is the part I wanted to key in on. It's that last line. Last line there. A tree that watched her as she ran. So is that just a generic weirwood tree? Or is that Bran in Arya's dream watching her? Because at this point in Winds of Winter, this is ahead of the Bran chapters that we have seen. And those Bran chapters are, especially the last one with his weirwood dreams, it's a timeless montage. So Bran is kind of in the weirwood net. We don't know. Like, he could be present in any, any of these streams at this point. So the tree that's watching her, I tend to think that's Bran checking in on Arya's dreams. And I think that Bran will also be checking into Sansa's dreams and reawakening her gift as well. Because remember, Bran awakened Jon's gift when he appeared as a tree and tapped him on the forehead. So I think he will do that for Sansa as well. But here I think, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, watching is a more active term than saw. Yeah, the tree watched her as she ran. Exactly, it sounds active. And the watchers, that's an important term as well. So yeah, I think, um, I think this is increasing evidence of Bran monitoring the other... Uh, you know, the other Starks. And then I will give you, as a bonus, we will now go to Vermeer Six Skins. And his warging experience. Which is the beginning of his chapter, of course. The night was rank with the smell of man. The warg stopped beneath the tree and sniffed, his gray-brown fur dappled by shadow. A sight, a sigh of piney wind brought the man scent to him over fainter smells that spoke of fox and hare, seal and stag, even wolf. Those were man smells too, the warg knew, the stink of old skins, dead and sour, near drowned beneath the stronger sense of smoke and blood and rot. Only man stripped the skins from other beasts and wore their hides and hair. Wargs have no fear of man as wolves do. Hate and hunger coiled in his belly, and he gave a low growl, calling to his one-eyed brother, to his small sly sister. As he raced through the trees, his packmates followed hard on his heels. They had caught the scent as well. As he ran, he saw through their eyes too, and glimpsed himself ahead. So that just shows you, like, Vermeer, as a skilled warg, he can see out of multiple wolf eyes at the same time. We should expect Bran and Arya to be able to do that as well. Um, she won't, you know, she's mainly in Nymeria, but Bran in particular 
we'll be able to see out of the eyes of basically any raven or wolf that's on a battlefield, you know. So it's pretty useful. The breath of the pack puffed warm and white from long gray jaws. Ice had frozen between their paws, hard as stone, but the hunt was on now, the prey ahead. Flesh, the warg thought, meat. A man alone was a feeble thing, big and strong with good sharp eyes, but dull of ear and deaf to smells. Deer and elk and even hares were faster, bears and boars fiercer in a fight. But men in packs were dangerous. As the wolves closed on the prey, the warg heard the wailing of a pup, the crust of last night's snow breaking under clumsy man paws. The rattle of hard skins and the long gray claws men carried, that's knives and swords, and armor. Swords, a voice inside him whispered, spears, and that's literally Vermeer's voice, sort of whispering to the wolf. Deaf to smells, yeah, it's, I love the turn of phrase there, it's great. The trees had grown icy teeth, snarling down from the bare brown branches. One eye ripped through the undergrowth, spraying snow. His packmates followed, up a hill and down the slope beyond, until the wood opened up before them and the men were there. So they're like two hills away, they can pick out all these smells. And this is again, just shows you like, the smells give wolves information even before they can see things. So it's totally different from people, for the most part. Let's see. And then the men were there. One was female. The fur-wrapped bundle she clutched was her pup. Leave her for last, the voice whispered. The males are the danger. They were roaring at each other as men did, but the warg could smell their terror. One had a wooden tooth as tall as he was. He flung it, but his hand was shaking, and the tooth sailed high. And that's a spear, obviously. Then the pack was on them. His one-eyed brother knocked the tooth thrower back into a snowdrift and tore his throat out as he struggled. His sister slipped behind the other male and took him from the rear. That left the female and her pup for him. She had a tooth, too, a little one made of bone, but she dropped it when the warg's jaws closed around her leg. As she fell, she wrapped both arms around her noisy pup. Underneath her furs, the female was just skin and bones, but her dugs were full of milk. The sweetest meat was on the pup. The wolf saved the choice parts for his brother. All around the carcasses, the frozen snow turned pink and red as the pack filled its bellies. Sorry, baby. It's just nature, you know. Nothing personal. Well, actually, it's Vermeer. It's a little bit personal. Actually, yeah, that's kind of messed up. It's not a wolf. This is a person. A person inside of a wolf. And he's not hesitating. He's like, yes, the best meat's on the baby. So, just shows you how, you know, Vermeer's without conscience. Because if this were Bran, he wouldn't joyfully be eating the baby. Like, yeah, sweet. Like, Bran would be like, oh my God. So, yeah. Um, if it were a wolf, you'd be like, well, that's just nature. But it's a warg. So yeah, this is abomination. Abom no, this is definitely abomination. And that's... The, okay, so I should, should just kept reading, I guess. Leagues away, in a one-room hut of mud and straw, with a thatched roof and a smoke hole and a floor of hard-packed earth, Vermeer shivered and coughed and licked his lips. His eyes were red, his lips cracked, his throat dry and parched, but the taste of blood and fat filled his mouth, even as his swollen belly cried for nourishment. A child's flesh, he thought, remembering Bump. Human meat. Had he sunk so low as to hunger after human meat? He could almost hear Hagen growling at him. Men may eat the flesh of beasts and beasts the flesh of men, but the man who eats the flesh of man is an abomination. Um, so, a child's flesh he thought remembering bump. So, okay, look. This is not made clear, but we should understand later in the chapter, like, Veramir's parents found their dog, one of their dogs, eating Bump, Hagen's br or Veramir's brother. Veramir did that when he was inside the wolf. Now Veramir was six, 
and he was in a rage. Remember, him and his little brother fought over a toy or something, and then he essentially warged into his dog and killed his brother. So when he's thinking a child's flesh remembering Bump, like Vermeer has eaten a child before, his brother. So it is um, very disturbing. Very disturbing. And um, as I pointed out many times, like kids get in fights with each other, but they don't have the power to really hurt each other. So they just throw toys at each other or something or push, little kid push. But with a warg child who has no counseling and no coaching, he just sort of warged into the dog and took out his childish anger on his brother. So, it's pretty messed up. Abomination. Yes, very much so. That had always been Hagen's favorite word. Abomination, abomination. To eat of human meat was abomination. To mate as wolf with wolf was abomination. And to seize the body of another man was the worst abomination of all. Hagen was weak, afraid of his own power. He died weeping and alone when I ripped his second life from him. Veramir had devoured his heart himself. He taught me much and more, and the last thing I learned from him was the taste of human flesh. So Vermeer ate the heart as a person, not as a wolf. So Vermeer, this is, this is like definitely ancient spiritual belief, like eating someone's heart or flesh to gain power. This is definitely what Vermeer did. He ate Hagen's heart like... He probably had his wolf rip it out and then he ate it himself. Like that's not only that, but he stole Hagen's second life from him for no reason, really. Oh no, I guess I'm wrong. He taught me much and more. And the last thing I learned from him was the taste of human flesh. That was as a wolf though. Scratch what I just said. Sorry. He had never eaten the meat of men with human teeth. Okay. I was wrong. He would not grudge his pack their feast, however. The wolves were as famished as he was, gaunt and cold and hungry, and the prey, two men and a woman, a babe in arms, fleeing from defeat to death. They would have perished soon in any case from exposure or starvation. This way was better, quicker, a mercy. All right, so that's, that is the end of his wolf dream. All right, uh, what a nice bonus. Bonus, everyone. Bonus content. <laughs> yeah. Vermeer is messed up. Uh, no, let me see, read this again. Let's see. Yeah, he had never eaten the meat of men with human teeth. So, no. But he is going to, uh, obviously, try to steal Thistle's body. So. so, you can see, like, it's interesting. It's easy to see Varamir as this really predatory bad dude, because that's what he is. Um, but you can also see how there's a, like the Starks are pretty animalistic too. Arya embracing her war gift. Remember, he's like, oh, Hagen is weak. He's afraid of his gift. Arya is not afraid of her gift. She eats people as her wolf all the time. Just like Varamir does. She doesn't hesitate. Like we just saw her all the way back in Clash of Kings. She's ripping a guy's arm off and shaking it around in the rain. And then she wakes up and she's like, that was so beautiful. Like, Arya is savage, dude. She's not all that different from Vermeer in the sense that she is, does not care about warging prohibitions. Now, she's obviously not a bad person in the way that Vermeer, like Vermeer is a serial rapist, right? Arya hasn't done anything like that. The people that Arya kills are people that are trying to kill her or bad people like the Mummers or well, the one hair in Holgar that was just kind of in her way. But, you know, she had to escape, so. 
Yeah. And we have yet to see what Rickon, like when the curtain comes up on Rickon and Skagos and Shaggy Dog and the enormous horny goats, like what's that going to look like? I do think there are probably wargs on Skagos, so it actually might not be too bad. Rickon might have received some warg coaching. What about Nymeria pulling Cat from the river? Um, yeah, that is an interesting scene. She pulls Cat from the river, and then Beric and Thoros, you know, or Beric, I guess, reses her. So yeah, that's another evidence that like Nymeria is getting using her psychic ability to sort of keep abreast of what's going on. She probably didn't just find Stoneheart in the river; like she must have sensed that. So yeah, because Nymeria is joined to Arya, she must have some psychic awareness of Cat as well. Oh, it would have been oh okay, would have been um Grey Wind. Nymeria would have known about the Red Wedding through Grey Wind, and she also would have seen. Ar she also shares Arya's knowledge of the Red Wedding as well. So yeah, that kind of all makes sense. Is there a specific question about that? What about Nymeria pulling Cat from the river? Is there a specific? That's what I got on that. And I will go ahead and take final call for questions and then wrap it up. Been about three hours. Yeah, Rickon, we don't know. Rickon could be really dark. It could be really dark. He might not be a good person, really. I mean, he's traumatized and left alone. I think Asha's doing a good job, though. Osha, the wildling. I think Rickon will be all right. It's just hard to say. It's a kind of a black box right now. Schrodinger's Rickon. Just how savage. Will it be our savage or will we be like, oh my God. It's not going to be pretty, guys. Like, abandoning a three or four year old child with war gifts to be, I mean, it's, what he went through is just as rough as what Arya's gone through. So like, yeah, that's not going to be pretty. Like, George is going to show that toll that's been taken. I'm sure. It's going to be hella traumatized. That doesn't mean he won't be able to like help out, you know, but uh, we'll see. I'm very curious to see what will happen when the uh, Sky Go See Horny Goats and Rickon show up. Oh, mention of a song. Yes, thank you. I was about to skirt out of here. Let's look it up. Okay, so it's um It's in the garage that I have. Um, Surf Wax America. Do I have that one? Let me see if I did that. I can't remember if I did that or not. That's the one that's like, You take your car to work, I'll take my board. I don't think I have done that one. I think it's Rock Rock Hodge I was thinking of. You'll have to settle. Okay, let's see here. All right, 30, let me take, let me, uh, let me just clear the throat and then I will come back and do this one second.
All right. I've got a shadow binder guide. I've got a meiji to die. I've got a burning pyre and Cal Drogo too. Waiting there for me, yes I do. Yes I do. I've got the flames up real tall. My favorite fiery kiss. I've got some dragon babies since Rego didn't live. Waiting there for me, yes I do. Yes I do. Let's see, how does it, uh, let's see. Rock, rock, hush, Kalaka doth ray. The prince is riding inside me today. Rock, rock, hush, the boy is strong. Because I chewed horse heart so long. Rock, rock, hush. And that's actually what the uh, priestess says. Rock, rock, hush, Kalaka doth ray. So yes, I put Dothraki in the Weezer song and match the syllables. Appreciate me. Okay. I've got Sherakia. More Dothraki. I've got the Bleeding Star. This, ra- this red waist is stupid long. Oh, I think I messed up. Okay, let me start this first over. I've got Sherakia. This red waist is stupid long. I hate quaith stupid words, but I love me dragons. Fire and blood for me, yes I do. Yes I do. Rock, rock, hush. I feel sane. Death will pay for life today. Rock, rock, hush. Those are PayPal's coming in. The boy is strong. No one told me he'd be a dragon. Rock, rock, hush. All right, what's happening? Go look up in the garage if you want to hear the regular version. And then go back and listen again. You can hear the the melody. But there you go. It's all about waking dragons to the tune of In the Garage. Thank you. Thank you. I can hear the clapping. It's out there. The silent clap. Oh, yes. Let's see if that was, in fact, a PayPal. Or if it, was, it could have been my manager telling me to stop. It could have been that, too. Dave, what are you doing? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, nope, just a cannabis dispensary trying to tell me about a sale. Oh, well. I'm sure PayPal's will come in after the fact for my singing. So, yeah. No, nah, the cop. We're good on copyright if there's no music, so the karaoke is that'd be all right. And I changed the words, so really, we're safe. We're safe. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, I guess I didn't. Are there any final questions? Or let me see if I have any final Wolf Dream thoughts. Um, I think I mostly gave them during the stream. The point is that uh, just as the Valerian sorcerers are incredibly effective because of. Uh, the glass candle communication. The wolves have, love you too, Reiko. The wolves have a psychic network that the more you focus on it, and this is how, this is why we do these kind of streams. When you clear everything else out and you just focus on the wolf streams, <laughs> plug the zombie, you can see how, how much was going on here. Like, this is a psychic network. It may or may not be tied to the Weirwood Net. I'm, I am voting no. And I've got a specific reason. I actually think that Weirwoods, guys, just to tease a future theory that I'm fleshing out, I think Weirwoods were brought to Westeros by the Green Men. I do not think they were always in Westeros. I think they were brought there. And then you have skin changers breaking into them. So... I think skin changers were there in Westeros before before Weirwoods. And uh, so I think that, and also just from watching this and looking at all these quotes, it seems like the wolves have psychic communication that really doesn't have anything to do with the trees. There's not even a hint of trees in a lot of this wolf talk. So 
in the Arya scene, there was like she's in the Godswood when she hears the wolf howl that sort of kicks her into a reverie. That one was made to question it. Most of the others seem to be just like wolf to wolf communication. So I'm glad you guys are having fun in the chat. <laughs> Yeah. I've I've I turned I've got a dungeon master's guide and a 12-sided die into I've got a shadow binder guide and I've got a magey to die. That's brilliant stuff that you guys that I just dropped on y'all. So, my singing is you know mostly sort of on pitch that's about all i'll say for it but uh those lyrics are fire so <laughs> anyway oh abomination now oh, my voice isn't an abomination come on no it's not what y'all were saying do you think Arya will get the power to take over bodies like bran her wolf has a lot of homies behind her so it makes me wonder if she'll have her pack no nah, the um well i guess she could i'm not sh okay the body snatching might not be a green seer thing. It's not. No, Varamir's not a green skier. A green skier. He's not a green seer. And he is. He tries to steal Thistle's body. He doesn't succeed. But yeah, technically Arya could do that. I hope she doesn't. But I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, she has the ability to kill someone and carve their face off and wear it potentially by the time she gets back to Westeros, so, yeah. It's not near the pitch, sorry, dude. Thanks, C. Bob. Gee whiz, man. You couldn't even, couldn't even let me have that. Brutal. Sorry, you must be an actual singer. I used to be married to an actual singer. I'm well aware that I'm not an actual singer, okay? That's brutal. Ah, it's brutal. It was so pretty. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Bebe. Building me up, giving me compliments. Almost like you guys want me to sing again. I guess Bob does not want me to sing again. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Duet with Glidus. No, see, Glidus is a real... <laughs> Glidus can sing. He can play the piano, too. Now, he's a real musician. Now, me and Glidus have discussed doing a music discussion stream. So go bug the fuck out of Glidus on his channel. Tell him to collaborate with me. We should. We'd have a great time. Glidus is a very funny person. Big Glidus fan over here. When will your next House of the Dragon stream be? Reiko, pretty soon. I'm getting ready to turn back to some House of the Dragon pretty soon. I'm just waiting for people to more people to beg for it. You saw his band play? Oh, wow. That's so cool. You've seen Glidus' band play. That's awesome. Uh, Glidus, by the way, he did a, a breakdown of the Game of Thrones theme where he got into the music theory of it and why it works and stuff. I mean, like, he's a real musician. He understands theory really well. It was a very good video. I highly recommend that. If any of the mods want to drop that in or just go check out Glidus' channel. Don't make us beg. That's what we're doing. <laughs> he has a Ren Fair rock band. Oh my God. I got to get that booked at the con when I, that I'm going to put on one day. House of the Dragon stream went. Okay. Um, uh, soon. We'll schedule one in soon. I have, so I've got a list of ideas for streams and videos that I'm constantly adding to. And then I just sort of draw from it based on what I'm inspired to do. Um, I think we're talking about going back to House of the Dragon pretty soon. We're just giving it a little bit of a rest. But yeah, soon. And I've got specific projects that I'm planning to do. We're definitely going to do a reread of Fire and Blood, the, the section that's going to be made into season two. Me and Tim will read that to y'all. So yeah, okay, I see some people are ready. When do we get a trailer? No idea, Cheryl. Everything in Hollywood is up in the air. That strike is not over yet. That is not worked out yet, so we're still we're, we're waiting to see. 
Will they ever do anything else with 1899? I mean, I'd love to, Namo, but it would just be me talking for my own entertainment. Oh, the chat's not moving. Sorry. That would just be me talking for my own entertainment. I mean, they killed the series, so it's 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 terrible. It's tough. I loved 1899, and I still think it's definitely worth watching that first, the one season that exists, but it's not much call for videos about it. Oh, it was so interesting. Every time I think about it, I'm like, get into the plot again, and then I get sad again. It's time for, oh, I should dye my hair. I thought about dyeing the hair a different color on top. I'm probably just going to cut it back short, though. Because, guys, anytime it's not tied back, it's annoying as hell. I do not like having hair in my face. I now understand what women deal with. I'm sorry, women, for not understanding that hair is annoying. Because it is. It's annoying. Gonna chop it. Team Black, where are you at? <laughs> We're Team Small Folk. I'm Team Small Folk. But, yeah, you can root for whoever you want. Hey, good girl. Cool, guys. Well, let's go ahead and wrap it up. I'd say that's good enough. And uh, I will see you on Sunday. Tell me about this. One of the streams I'm thinking about doing that I will do soon is uh, a Tywin Lannister character study, a.k.a. why Tywin Lannister is a giant failure who should not be emulated and was not successful in any way. Do you want to see that? Because that's one of my ideas. We got some House of the Dragon stuff, which again, probably the reread will be first, just to kind of get back into things. I also was thinking about doing just a worst people in Westeros stream, like just top 10 worst people. Tywin's on the list, obviously. But there's lots of other terrible people to talk about, too. Yes, people simp for Tywin, just as people simp for Magor. And, uh,. I think I could put people in their place on Tywin in just one stream instead of three, like we did for Magor, but. Yes, on the Tywin stream. Yeah, there and there's more, of course, there's more to talk about than just scolding him for the Red Wedding. There's, it's a lot of interesting psychology with his kids. And yes, Charles Dance is still hot and is an amazing actor. I mean. For an old man, I guess. Couldn't you see him doing the, the like, the cologne commercials that, like, Jack Palance or whoever used to do? I think that's... Man, that's an old memory scratching at my memory there. Okay. World-class D-head, yeah. He's just... Charles Dance just has presence, you know? Like, the presence is incredible. He dominates every scene. A mature discussion about sex work and its symbolism in A Song of Ice and Fire is something I'd like to see. So I actually did have two sex workers on a live stream to discuss sex work in A Song of Ice and Fire a long time ago. Uh, but after a certain amount of time, they asked me to take it down because, of course, people that are engaged in sex work sometimes have concerns about anonymity and stuff like that. So we had to take it down. It was a great discussion, though. It really was interesting. We did not talk about symbolism at all. We talked about actual sex workers in the story because there's a lot of them. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a facet of society that George does not neglect. It is definitely there. Uh, the symbolism of the sex workers is something that uh, kind of is hard to talk about, to be honest. I have thought about it some, and I've definitely seen some other people explore it. Uh, but it is disturbing, because you're... It's one thing to talk about the symbolism of people dying and being mutilated and stuff, but the symbolism of, like, when you're talking about sexual abuse and then decoupling, like, the the human factor of the scene to just talk about the symbolism, you end up doing some really weird comparisons. And it's like, it's really tricky. Um, I have generally avoided it. But it is there. And I think it has something to do 
with the green seers and the weirwoods, how they're sort of wedding each other and sort of using each other. Um, but yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> it's definitely a stream that probably won't be monetized, but it probably should be talked about. I mean, it's definitely in the story. And so far as I know, the stream that I did uh, is the only real exploration of sex workers that has been done. And it's a shame that I had to take it down. It was a really good conversation. I learned, definitely learned a lot. It was a very good perspective. I mostly just asked questions and got out of the way, you know, obviously. With uh, the two guests had plenty to say, but. Sacred prostitution still exists. It's called vulture capitalism. <laughs> There's nothing sacred about vulture capitalism. Mel's work... In, yeah, so Mel is technically a slave of the Red Temple, and she's doing sex magic with a, a purpose in mind. Like, she's making shadow babies for strategic reasons. So she, she is using uh, sex for a utilitarian purpose, certainly. Yeah, Mel is very Bene Gesserit-like. Cool, well, I think I'll go ahead and wrap it up there. And uh, thanks, thanks for coming out, guys. But yeah, I'm hungry, I'm gonna go get some food. And I will see you on Sunday. I'm not sure if we'll do the Stannis this Sunday, but we'll do something cool. And uh, I will be here. 3 p.m. And Tim will be here too. So thanks a lot, guys. Have a great one.